instead of calling it a line of independence, I should call it like a line of sex. I bet you people would listen more. We're way more, right? Yeah. It's like, if you fall below this, you can't have sex anymore. Yeah. Whoa, I don't care about someone else wiping my ass when I poop, but like, if I can't have sex, I'm out. I'm out. Right. Yeah. I'm Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Today, our guest is Dr. Andy Galpin. He is a professor and scientist of human performance and a PhD in human bioenergetics and muscle physiology. He is also an elite athlete coach and consultant and a founder of Biomolecular Athlete, a specific program designed to help individuals reach their peak performance. Dr. Andy Galpin is renowned for providing high-quality education for free to people around the world through his social media. Today, we talked about how to prevent falls and optimize your body as you age. We talked about the importance of using exercise to maximize health and longevity. We talk about how VO2 max is highly correlated with aging and how a decline in VO2 max can lead to getting down to a threshold of the ability to do normal daily activities if it's not maintained. We also talk about the gear system for breathing instead of using zones to evaluate your performance. We talk about the three by five method to achieve strength goals. We also talk about how to design the optimal workout if you have 20 minutes a day for five days a week, how to design a program for fat loss, for strength, and for muscular hypertrophy. And of course, we talk about sexual activity. How can you prevent injury and continue to have excellent sex through the lifetime by looking at the metabolic equivalent units associated with sex and the range of motion needed to have sex? I hope you guys enjoy this episode as much as I did. Dr. Galpin, thank you so much for joining us today. It is truly an honor to have you. I have watched a lot of your content, listened to many of your interviews, and you have an exceptional ability to educate the masses using science, using real knowledge, and it's truly uh, an honor to have you. I appreciate all the compliments. You know, I think for those of people who don't know you and haven't l- watched all of your content, let's review a little bit about why is muscular health and endurance so important and how does that change over a lifetime? Yeah, well, first of all, I have to acknowledge my conflict of interest here. I am a muscle physiologist. I'm an exercise scientist. Uh, I'm going to be biased uh, for muscle in any case and every case. So I will grant you all of that. Myself and the companies that I have uh, are almost always hedged towards working with high performers. Mm -hmm. That's traditionally professional athletes, but in recent years, the general public as well. So we have a lot of non-athlete clients. But what's unique about all of them is they're all striving for high performance. So you're a doctor. I'm a fake doctor, right? I'm the different kind of doctor. I'm a PhD. You're a true MD. So I don't do anything from that side of the equation. And I'm, and I'm giving that background to say, when I think about why you want muscle, why it's important, we tend to think of those two spectrums, athletes, and I'm not an athlete, but I'm interested in aging or longevity, as different. Mm-hmm. And I really am going to try to make an argument here as strong as I can that they are not. Yeah, I the, agree. They're not. The reality of it is you want your body functioning at its highest abilities possible, regardless of what you're going to use that for. Hit a golf ball better, be a better pickleball player, be a better parent, leader, whatever, right? I boil it down to three things. Everyone basically wants the same three things out of their body. You want to look a certain way. You want to feel a certain way. You want to perform a certain way. Those mean different things to different people. I don't care. You Tell me how you want to feel every day, what you want to perform in, and how you want to look. And now we'll go about solving that problem. You don't get any of those things without high-functioning muscle. So to me, this is your interface with the world. And I know people love to give a credit to the neuromuscular system, right? And people love to give credit to the brain and everybody. I'm like, well, great. That's true. But ain't none of that crap working if you don't have muscle. And we can run a long list of things that muscle does, why it matters, and we can play any game you want here. But I'll give you a couple to toss them out there. Uh, I said this a second ago, but remember, muscle is the way you interface with the world. Uh, Your ability to have connections, to touch, to move, to grab is all based on muscle's ability to function. Of course, I have to have a neural nervous system innervation, but nothing happens if you say go and muscle doesn't go. It is also what people don't realize is it is by far the biggest organ in your body. Um, So we have always been told, probably actually when you and I were in school, the answer to that question would have been skin. Yeah. That's great. But muscle's far bigger. And what's it mean to be an organ? It just means that it communicates to the rest of the body. And we have always been told this story that kind of muscle is stupid. The brain makes decisions. It sends a signal to the, to the muscle, tells it to contract. 
as if it's a one-way street. And now we realize there are a number of things coming out of muscle that are sending information to the brain, to the lymphatic system, to the kidneys, to the liver, to any other organ in your body. And so it is a two-way street. If you don't have then high quality and high functioning muscle, you're losing that entire communication mechanism. It is the primary place in which we store and regulate blood glucose. You could talk endlessly about the problems, across, not just diabetes, but anything else associated with brain health, mood regulation, all these things that are associated with poor glucose regulation. Those number of reasons. You can throw all that away, and I can still make a pretty cogent argument that says just look at epidemiology. Look at what happens with skeletal muscle mass and its relationship to all-cause mortality. It's basically a linear, right? Increasing skeletal muscle, especially, and here's the key, if the muscle has been accrued via physical exercise, then you're going to see just a positive association here. I'm not even getting into muscle function yet. Muscle quality, leg strength, grip strength, all these things, and how well and how much of a predictor of hazard ratios and risks and longevity and all this stuff, right? So as just my like abstract of an answer, and you, you pick which game you want to play here, and I could make a pretty strong argument for a long time uh, that muscle really, in my opinion, is the key to living a long and high productive life. I completely wholeheartedly agree. I think that... I could tell you got a gym right here. I do. I do. <laughs> so yeah, for those of you who are watching, I have a gym in my studio. Yeah. Um, because we really um, make it a part of our lives and our children's lives. And I think yeah. it's extremely important for long-term health. I mean, when we look at things like frailty, yep. uh, must, that's a, basically how we assess someone's vitality when they age. And particularly people who are frail, they can't get surgery or they're going to have worse outcomes with surgery. As I'm a surgeon, we look at it from that perspective, but it's in so many different things. And we have tests in medicine like the get up and go test, right? Yep. So yep. the time get up and go, but that's at the point where you're trying to assess someone's fall risk. We don't want to be at that point where we're looking at people who are at risk for fall. We want to prevent falls. Yeah. And so I think that's where muscle training and hypertrophy and strength all those things sort of play a role in preventing bad outcomes as we age. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about how sort of you can prevent bad outcomes in terms of aging, in terms of falling. Because I'll tell you, the number one thing that I often see in my patients is they fall. They fall in the middle of the night. They get up to go to the bathroom because they have nocturia, which means they wake yep. up more than once at night. They wake up to pee. Their lights are out. They can't see where they're going. They trip. They fall. They fracture their hip. And their outcomes are horrible. In fact, the risk of mortality in the one year after a fall is over 20%. So after a fall, that results in a hip fracture. So that's really problematic. And I think when you're younger, you don't think about those long-term outcomes. But everyone can admit they don't want to fall. Mm. Everyone can admit they want to be able to do basic activities of daily living. They want to be able to dress themselves. Yep. They want to be able to take their suitcase and carry it and put it up on the cabin when they're on the plane. They want to be able to lift their grandkids from the ground. Even if you're not interested in looking your best or being a performance athlete, those are, I think, everyone can agree on. Yep. You, uh, you mentioned the fall prevention risk, and that is you give the one year. Mm -hmm. If you look at the five-year and 10-year risk of death, it gets astronomically high. It's terrifying. Now, these are all in data that are like post to 60-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So if you fall at 40, like you're probably not going to die next right. year. You're fine. But again, uh, I think most of us, especially with where we're at, folks that are in their 30s to 50s, where modern medicine is, you're looking at legitimately 50 to 80 more years of life. How much more advanced are we going to get in basic emergency medicine from that. So the, your chances of dying of something really acute are just going to go down 50 plus years from now. Mm -hmm. Just don't die of dumb things. And your chances to live past 100 are going to be very high by the time people in our age demographic get to 100. And so not putting yourself at massive risk with things like a fall at 65. When we were kids, 65 was like, well, you fell 65 and died. Well, they had a good life. Now, if, now it's like, whoa, unacceptable. you're halfway there. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're mid you're midlife right now. Yeah. Like, none of us, like, especially if you get closer to that number, you're like, 65 is not, like, that's not an old number. Um, so if we take that basic idea and say, oh, great, like, you've convinced me. I'm running the show, by the way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the questions here a second. <laughs> uh, you, you, we've convinced this person that they don't want to have this risk of fault. Like, well, what does muscle have to do with it? The saying I will always come back to is, this is an old Bill Bowerman line from one of the founders of Nike. Like, if you have a body, you're an athlete. I don't care if you're interested in sports. If you have a body, you're defuncto interested in maximizing your hip abilities. If all you want to use that for is the skill to not fall, great. It still requires the same level of skill. So let's go all the way back to the very beginning. What causes people to fall? Well, you either have some sort of acute thing hit your foot. Otherwise, it's an induced loss of balance, mm -hmm. period. 
So number one, we don't want to lose balance. And I'm going to walk back through these things in a second, but that's the starting thing. Second thing, you're going to lose balance at some point. It's going to happen, right? Right. So then what do I do about that? We have to have the foot speed and specifically foot speed. Because if you fall and catch yourself and brace with a hand and you have an upper body broken bone, it's still very, very, very problematic. So you don't even fall and be able to catch yourself with your hand. Mm -hmm. It's better than a hip. But a broken hand for someone who's 65 and lives by themselves, somebody who's 75 lives by themselves, is really, really problematic, especially if you're already frail or sarcopenic, mm -hmm. right? So low muscle mass. So great. We need the foot speed to be able to put my foot back out in front of myself to where it needs to be to stop the fall. Now, let's say I got my foot out there. And I need to have the what's called eccentric strength. So the ability to put my foot in the right spot. And now it's got to be able to absorb all the forces of my body that are slamming into my foot. So if I got my foot out there, but I wasn't strong enough to stop the fall and I fell anyways, I haven't won. Mm -hmm. So I've got to have balance to prevent the fall in the beginning. Then if it happens, I've got to have foot speed to get my foot in the right position. And then I got to have the strength to absorb that force. Yeah. Okay, great. So then what are the actual tactics to do that? Well, any sort of balance training... And it doesn't have to specifically be balance training. It could be any activity of daily living. And so this is the difference between, instead of walking on the pavement at all time, mm -hmm. walk on something that's a little bit less stable. So walk on the grass. Instead of uh, on the treadmill, can you go on a hike on nature where the footing isn't so normal, right? Where you are in what we call asymmetrical balance, right? So it's not like my left foot and my right foot are balanced or in front of each other. I'm all set and ready to go, right? Mm -hmm. This is like science-wise and physiology-wise, we call this proprioceptin. Right? So it's your body's ability to understand where it is in the space. This is a signal being sent back to your brain. So this is a muscle issue, but really proprioception and balance is a cognitive and neural issue. I'll give you guys that one. There are some things that are cognitive and neural. you got to admit it. <laughs> I'm a curmudgeon about that. It's all muscle. The second and third one, though, now, now it's combination. So foot speed is a combination of muscle and nerve. So I have to understand and sense, wow, problem happened. Then I need to have the speed to be able to do that. That is an action. Uh, in this case, it would be fairly subconscious, right? So that's not going to need to go all the way back to somatic control. Go to the brainstem. This is as far as it needs to go, and then go right back into muscle. And so you've got entire neurons that are, are there to be sensing. They're called gamma motor neurons. They're there to sense where you're at in space. It senses that. It sends it back to the spinal cord. goes right back to alpha motor neurons, which are the neurons that cause the muscle to contract and say, hey, we fell right. Contract the muscles that pull us left. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like as simple as that, right? Now, the speed, though, is a, is a function of both that nervous system, but it is now coming down to muscle. You have a couple of different, broadly, fiber types in your muscle. Mm -hmm. Fast twitch and slow twitch, right? Slow twitch ones are very fatigue resistant. Mm -hmm. These tend to be ones that we call anti-gravity. Mm -hmm. So these are things like your soleus, the back of your foot, your lower back muscles. Um, these are muscles that are supposed to keep you upright. So you could stand for many hours at a time. I don't need them to produce force and speed, but I can't have them getting tired. Yeah. Anti-gravity, postural, things like that, right? Yeah. Your fast twitch fibers are the opposite. They're not supposed to be on very often, but they're meant for explosion and power. In this particular case, we're relying exclusively on those fast twitch fibers. Mm -hmm. This is not a fatigue issue. This is I've got to get my foot out six inches or six, two feet or whatever it's going to be as fast as humanly possible. I don't care if I get tired. Here's the major issue. Fast twitch fibers are preferentially lost with aging. As you get older, they will die. If you don't do anything specifically and actively to prevent that, you're going to lose them. So I don't care if your nervous system is firing at the highest capacity possible. If you don't have the muscle quality, in this case, the fiber type, to be able to actually get that distance that fast, it's going to be irrelevant. So you can't miss that boat. You have to have that. You can come back and talk about that if you want. But this isn't to finish it out. Once you've got your foot in the right spot, to have the strength to hold it there is also now fast twitch fibers. And so, yeah, you can do all the balance training you want, and that's going to be great to stop the fall from happening. But if it ever does happen, if you don't have fast twitch muscle fibers, two and three are not going to be there. And you're going to trip in life, right? So you need, you need to train those muscles too. It's not, it's a non-negotiable, right? right? Like a ton of things are going to happen, even just silly things like, um, I don't know, how old are your kids? They're 10 and seven. Okay, great. So your seven-year-old probably still is at the age where you probably runs and tackles randomly, pushes things over, does just like all kinds of stupid things. Right. You kids knock you over a thousand times, right? They do. Even unintentionally. They just want to love you. A hundred percent. Yeah. And so your grandkids come in the situation. Other kids come in the situation. Things are going to happen, right? Animals, if you're like from the country like I am, like an animal's going to back up accidentally or a dog's going to run underneath your foot. Yeah. Which, which mine do constantly, right? Right. You get it. Like the risk is there. It's going to happen. And 
So you, you need to have those fast fibers for two and three or you're done. When was the last time a doctor spent an hour with you and truly focused on what your goals are? When was the last time that you left the doctor's office feeling like you really understood what's going on with your body and had a clear plan of what was going to happen next? At my practice, Rena Malik, MD, I aim to give you just that. I specialize in sexual dysfunction, bladder conditions, hormone management, and pelvic pain for all genders. And I want to revolutionize how we take care of patients and really get to know each and every one of you. That's why at my practice, when you come to see me, I'm 100% present with you for an entire hour. And after you leave, if you forgot to ask me something or need clarification, don't worry. I'll respond to your issues and concerns quickly through our secure messaging portal with no extra fees or hidden costs. You don't even have to call the office to make an appointment. Just go online at www.renamalikmd.com slash appointments and schedule your appointment today. We see patients in Newport Beach, California, and virtually for patients located in the states of California, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, and Virginia. If you aren't located in those states, consider making an educational visit where we can talk about your conditions generally, but I can't diagnose or treat you as a patient. I can't wait to see you. When is the ideal time to start training these fast twitch fibers? And when does it really precipitously stop? Or is it more of a gradual death of these fibers? Yeah. So you have, in terms of what you're asking is, is kind of what we colloquially call muscle quality. Mm -hmm. uh, you have two major factors that go into that, muscle size and muscle performance. Between the ages of, you know, 25 and 40, you're probably going to lose 40% of your muscle. So sort of a rough number. That's a lot. You don't do anything about it. You're going to lose a lot of muscle over time, right? And if you look at, uh, again, literature on just muscle mass, um, this is actually effectively what sarcopenia is. There's actually some pretty cool, there's a movement going on right now. Sarcopenia is, we know that muscle mass is going to be lost with age. Yeah. Fine. Sarcopenia is the accelerated or advanced loss of muscle, right? So you're losing your muscle faster than your cohort. Yeah. Your age, demographic, yada, yada. All right, now- a lot of people, though, have said, look, muscle mass total is important, but if you look at almost any of the research in any of the areas, what they're going to say is muscle function is more important than muscle size. Okay. So you don't want to be under-muscled. This is a huge problem, but you really, really don't want to be weak and slow. Yeah. That's the bigger concern. So we know that's going to happen, that loss of total muscle. We also know that like, if you just look at things like basic muscle fiber numbers, so how many muscle fiber you have, that number is just going to like smashingly go down. You can prevent that a little bit, but it's, it's not going to go to zero. This is a part of aging. The loss of muscle, fast twitch muscle fibers, though, is a little bit of a different conversation. If you train appropriately, you have very little to no change and loss in those things. If you don't, it can be monumental. Uh, it, can be it can be massive. Um, we have biopsied people. We've done a couple of different things uh, that they are relevant here. One, um, I biopsied a set of twins that were 52, 53 at the time. One of them was... Uh, uh, like a delivery truck driver. Okay. I think he delivered potato chips. That's <laughs> just, it's just funny. Uh, super sweet guy. And the brother had done, I don't know, probably like 50 plus endurance races. He had never stopped. He'd done Ironmans and half marathons and things like that. We had all of his training logs and his notes wow. for 30 years. It was great. Oh, he kept all those. Kept them all. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it was really, I love, like, I love exercise dorks like that because I'm like, oh, I know I'm going to have tons of data. Yeah. Uh, which like scientifically gave us Lots of validation. Right. What was interesting, these twins were monozygous, which means they have the exact same DNA. Yeah. Right. They're, they're literally clones. Yeah. Right. You, you certainly could tell us more like, but <laughs> yeah. they're literally the same person split, right? Yep. And they both did the same thing basically to, through high school, and then they split. And so we had 30 plus years of same DNA, but different lifestyle. This is like the best exercise science yeah. experiment yeah. ever, right? It's like what you want for everything. I was like drooling. Right. This is actually one of our grad students. It was her dad and uncle. Oh, wow. And she didn't tell me for like many years in the program. <laughs> and then it came up and we were like, wait, what? Like your dad and uncle are the perfect science experiment ever. And you just waited four years to tell us. This? Well, and their lifestyles are so dramatically different. Like that is just a gold mine, right? Gold mine. That would that doesn't happen usually. Never. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, like I'll never stop giving her grief for that. Like why was that not like day two? Yeah. Like day two, you should have started with that one. 
But nonetheless, we biopsied them, and the trained twin, uh, now this, again, this individual didn't lift, didn't do any uh, real sprint work or anything. It was just steady state cycling, swimming, running. Uh, this guy in his, his leg is his vast lateral, the outside quad muscle, mm -hmm. uh, which in most humans is, it, on average, it's going to be like half 50% fast, 50% slow. Other muscles are different based on function. Uh, he was 90 plus percent slow twitch. Almost exclusively slow twitch. We had lost? Lost all of his solid. Yeah. The other twin was like textbook, what you'd predict. It was something like 40% slow twitch. I think he was like 30% fast twitch, and then the rest were made up of these, uh, what are called hybrid fibers. They're like half fast and half slow uh, that are also associated with inactivity. So there's so it was like it nailed it right on the, the textbook definition of him. So that's to say not that endurance exercise is bad for you, but he had clearly pushed himself from genetic starting point to almost exclusively slow twitch fibers, which indicates your ability to move up and down that spectrum is almost unlimited. Give it enough adaptation and 30 plus years of the same exposure. That's really exciting because I think a lot of people feel that maybe they're genetically disadvantaged. And sure, there probably are genetic disadvantages, but they're also racially disadvantaged or gender disadvantaged. Totally. And, and that may not be the case if you're consistent over 30 years. Well, what you're saying. Both are true. Yeah. Like, are there differences there with any number of variables? Uh, some of them, yes. Some of them, no. But in large part, yes, we are different people. Mm -hmm. 100%. And some of us are in better starting spots than the other ones, no doubt. But your ability to move within your own genetic profile is almost effectively unlimited. I mean, pick your metric and they all move. Yeah. I mean, I can say, for, for example, women we know uh, will not gain the muscle the same qual quantity as men, right? Totally. And then in terms of um, racially, like South Asians don't create as much muscle mass as other races. And yeah. so there are obviously uh, baseline baseline genetic differences. Of course. But the, the fact that you can overcome them is, is really impressive. You can overcome them enough to where you can live the life you want. Yeah. You 100% can live, can look, feel, and perform the way you want within, you know, whatever starting place you have based on background. So if, if someone who may be, so say let's just for the same example, a female South Asian wanted to be a high-performing athlete, that's totally possible, right? They're not going to overcome. Of they can overcome whatever genetic disadvantage they have. Yeah. There's no, there's no rationale to think that. In fact, we also have, not from my lab, but from others, twins research suggesting the same thing. There was a, a study that came out on lifelong resistance exercise training folks in the last few months, which is great. Because we have all this research on lifelong endurance exercisers, and now we're finally getting to the age where we have people who've lifted for 35, 40 plus years. Yeah. And those folks uh, were able to sufficiently preserve their fast twitch muscle fibers. In the same study, the other group, which were not lifelong lifters, were not able to. So, I, like, I just don't know how much more evidence you need. Yeah. Like, you, you go to this end of the spectrum, you go to that end of the spectrum, and it, it like, it lines up almost in a way where you don't believe it because, like, scientifically, it, it's perfect yeah. for the most part. So. Yeah. Um, unless you have like a, an inability to actually exercise, you're missing a limb or something like that. Outside of that, like physiologically, you got a chance. So if there is, well, so let's say we put two people together and one is genetically advantaged and one is not, does the one who's not, do they have to do 20% uh, more? Like, is there a, you know, how much more do they have to work in terms of getting the same result? It, yeah. It may not be a case of having to work hard at all. Really? It's could potentially be doing something different. Okay. And so you may respond uh, to a certain type of training better than I respond, but I respond to a different type of training better. So it's, it's more of like an apple and orange versus thing rather than it is like, well, you know, like I'm an apple and you're a rotten apple. Like it, it's just, you need something different potentially. Yeah. So you, you did mention training optimally, right? To, to get to the point where you have the optimal, to prevent fast twitch muscle de degradation, so to speak. And um, and then having to figure out what's optimal for you. How do, yeah. how do you go about doing that? If you're just a person who's never worked out before yeah. or has done very little or like for many years has not, how do you figure that out? Okay, I'll go a little bit backwards. And I'll, I'm going to maybe irritate some listeners just a little bit here okay. um, because I really, I'm going to acknowledge this is not within the capabilities of most people. Mm -hmm. But I think you need to understand gold standard. Mm -hmm. And then the goal would be, hey, how many things can I learn and take from the gold standard? within my scenario, all right? So I'm not saying this to um, rub things in your face for those of you that can't afford this, but right. 
The reality of it is with all of our stuff, this is the thing we've been doing with all of our professional athletes for many years. More recently, our rapid health and performance company for non-athletes, this is exactly the model we use. And I'll just share it all with the world. You can have all of our secrets. Great. Uh, it doesn't matter. So we we take people through, and our entire philosophy is extensive data collection. Mm -hmm. um, this is not the medical model. And this is the opposite. Uh, typically takes our people 30 days or so to get through it. We, because we want extensive and over the top and in many cases superfluous data collection so that we can come up with very high precision and specific solutions. And then you get coached on that weekly, right? Or more or more often, as much as it wants to get to what we've called your performance anchors. So we are we are searching your entire physiology, your entire lifestyle, everything, and I mean everything, everything from we take well over five hundred biomarkers. Stool, urine, saliva, blood, and blood, and blood, and blood, and way more blood, right? Yeah. We're taking a ton of it. We're running full, legitimate, FDA-approved sleep, clinical sleep analysis in your own bedroom. We're running environmental scans of your house. We, are, are, we want to know the water, where you get it from, or we're, we're looking at that. Uh, we're running tons of psychological evaluations, extensive tracking of what you do. How much do you, how much do you lose? We're tracking your urine. Not just, like, how much do you lose? We're weighing it. All your food, like everything that is possibly as much as we can, we're accounting for. What this means, we can then look through the entire system and go, oh, okay, for you, your three biggest issues are your water quality. That's not a very common one, but just as a random one. Um, something going on, let's say, in your micronutrient status of so your blood mm -hmm. and the timing of your day. And for another person, it might be you actually need meditation you need more high intensity exercise, and then you need to actually get more sun exposure. Whatever the case is, right? We can give people fairly simple solutions that have huge impact because we can see what are putting the biggest constraints on their physiology. So we, the, the, our clients tend to feel like we have these miracle results. Yeah. Not really. It's just you actually invested the time in looking at everything instead of just coming in and saying, okay, can we, can we, we look at A and B? And then you go try this for five months. Ah, it didn't work. All right, well, we need to go to the, I need to go to C and D. Okay, great. That's the cheaper approach. Yeah. But the folks we've worked with have way more time than money. Mm -hmm. And so they've come in and said, just do everything. I acknowledge it's going to be hundreds of dollars more of tests than I maybe need. But you don't know that until you know that. Right. So that's how we go about it. The point I'm trying to make for people that, again, can't get into programs like that is to say, you really should do a comprehensive analysis of all things that are adding to what we would like call your allostatic load. Mm -hmm. So... When you want to get a physiological change, mm -hmm. adaptation requires stress. Okay, great. But you don't want that. You want specific adaptations. Right. You want this thing to happen in this area, which means you require specific stress. But I still have to know what your total recovery capacity is. And in order to know that, I have to know what's the total allostatic load. That's the science word of saying like all stress is stress. Yeah. Right? So the allostasis is there. And so if I look at your stuff and, and you're wondering why your training program is working and you're wondering like, man, is it my genetics? Well, that's always an option, right? Yeah. We've never had to give that answer to somebody. In my entire career, I've never, ever once had to come back and go, I think something's going on with your genetics. Hmm. It's never once happened. Because I, if I look at enough things, I can go, oh, okay, yeah, you're not responding to that. You have an exten extensive amount of load in this area. Say it is mental health. Mm -hmm. Say it is sleep architecture, right? Say it is something actually in the formaldehyde in your walls are leaking. There's mold. Like there's something happening that's adding to your allostatic load. Those could be visible stressors. Mm -hmm. um, visible stressors are things you feel. I don't feel good. You know you're drinking. You know you're smoking. You know you're not exercising. You Like you see, feel these things. You know you're overweight. You know you're not eating great foods could be a hidden stressor. You don't feel like you're out of, you low on vitamin C. Mm -hmm. Like you don't feel yeah. zinc deficiencies. You just don't feel right. So there's all these potential hidden stressors and we will almost, well, we have literally a 100% of the time been able to see something that is like, whoa, this is a major problem. And so what, what's happening is your allostatic load is so high mm -hmm. that there's nothing left to adapt. And so what we need to do is remove that non-specific stressor and let you add more stressors in the focused area we want, let's just say exercise. But now you're recovering so much better from it 
you're getting more adaptation. And that has always been our focus and in, in defining like what are those performance anchors, you know, three, four, like sometimes 10 or 11, mm -hmm. and then which ones you are you able to fix and which ones can we control um, and which ones do we need to outsource to, whether it be an MD or um, mental health or whatever the thing is, or one like, like a good example, of we've dealt with a number of high profile athletes that, um, this is that they have habits that um, are an easy answer, mm -hmm. but they're honest and like, yo, I'm not doing I'm not going to stop drinking. Stop that. Yeah. I'm not stopping. Or um, it's like, yo, well, I play professional baseball, so I'm going to be on the road every five days. That is a massive stressor. Yeah. But that is part of the gig. So I can't come in and be like, you know, you should really stop traveling so much. It's like, <laughs> I can't. Okay. It's part of my job. Yeah. That is my job, right? Okay, great. So now we have to figure out, like, what other stressors can we pull from the system because that one's non-negotiable. And so what we do with our folks is find, like, what are the non-negotiables, whether it's legit, genetic, something else, or, you know, ones like that. And then we work around and we try to make that. We don't, again, to be clear, we don't lower the stress load. You have to have stress to adapt. You're just changing it. We want to make focus. it specific. Yeah. The, all the stressors coming in a specific area. And again, our solution I don't care. We are tool and technique agnostic. I don't care, right? If for you, your stress load gets reduced by a cold bath, great. Mm -hmm. That makes your, if your stress goes up with that, that's out. You hate meditation, great, that's out. But you love, you know, cycling at a low intensity. Okay. <laughs> We're going to work with you to figure out like what works best for your physiology. And, and by doing that, like you're taking potential losses out of the equation, your chances of success just get very, very high. So. What I'm getting is that when you're trying to see benefit, say, let's say exercise, for example, you need to be able to focus all the stress that you're getting from exercise in essentially alleviating uh, or improving your health versus if you have other stressors, they're going to compete and take away from the benefits. So that's what people always seem to sleep well in yep. order to get good gains or you need to, um, you know, that's the biggest one I see, sleep well. Like that's a non-negotiable. You have to get good quality sleep. We have a large number of metrics that go into all of our calculations, nothing is weighted higher than sleep. In fact, it's over double the high as anything else. Like that's how ubiquitous of an impact it has on any outcome you want that's positive. I need more focus throughout the day. Brain fog. I'm in pain. Like you cannot name a metric or we're not going to say sleep is your number one yeah. tactic there. So for us, like good, okay sleep is a red flag. That's a red flag. If you're like, no, I sleep pretty well. Red flag. I sleep great. You want to hear I sleep great? Has to be. Yeah. We're leaving gains on the table. I can get away with you eating like pretty well. Yeah. I cannot get away with you sleep sleeping okay. It, 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 nothing magnifies more than sleep does. Yeah. And so yeah. we spend a lot of, and there's actually a, excellent research on this, on, again, good to great sleep. Sleep extension research is phenomenal. There's a handful of studies that are particularly interesting here. One of them. Um, I don't know if you've interacted with Sherry Ma yet at a Stanford. Not yet, no. Her, she did a classic number of studies there, um, a couple of them, but one of them was this this famous sleep extension study she did with the Stanford basketball team. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about Division One basketball players already pretty close to their ceiling of success. Had them sleep for two additional hours a night for between five to seven weeks, all right? This is in season two. All she said was two more hours a night, right? Some of them took naps to get two more hours. Some went to bed earlier, whatever. I think the end result was they end up sleeping like 1.5 to 1.7 hours That's additionally per day. It's a lot, right? Yeah. Now, there's lots of limitations with this real-world studies like this. That's always part and parcel of science. There's no control group. There's mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, though, because the results were so profound. Um, massive improvements in mood, sleepiness, awareness, like things like that. Yeah. But reaction time improved. Free throw shooting percentage went up like 9%. Wow. Three-point shooting percentage went up, I think, an additional 9%. And we saw a bunch of other metrics, like, again, across the board. Uh, endurance went up, and it's like a baseline to half court, to baseline to end of the court and back kind of, like, test went up. And this is in season with already pretty elite athletes. Like, do you know what a 10% improvement in shooting is in Division One basketball players? Like, that, that's an absurd that, yeah. number, right? Yeah. And they already, they, we're not talking about Sleep right. deprivation. Yeah. We're not talking about like they went like two straight days without sleep and then you gave them some sleep. It's like, well, sure. Of course they're going to perform better. Yeah. They weren't sleeping four hours a night. You're talking about people already sleeping decently well. And there's six, there, this is one study, but I could give you more and more. People that have slept seven and a half hours versus 
eight hours. Yeah. It just keeps getting better. Body composition, aerobic capacity, um, speed, tennis serving accuracy. There's been swimming studies done. There's been rugby studies done. There's been, like just so many things come out. When you go from good to great sleep, you just keep winning. It's life changing. Yeah. I mean, we're the only species, this is from Matt Walker, but we're the only species who intentionally avoid sleeping. Yeah. Look at your dogs. Tell me, tell me you're wrong. <laughs> so it's it's pretty profound. And even in hormone health, like we yeah. that's something we counsel patients on a lot. So if you want to boost your testosterone naturally, get better sleep. Like number one thing, get better sleep. And people always look at me like, yeah, I'm sleeping okay, you know. And I'm like, you are probably not. You're probably looking at your screen before bed. You're probably doing a lot of poor hygiene. I could terrify you even more on that one. Like, if you want to look at the research on people's perception of sleep, it's terrible. People are often off. In terms of duration, you're talking about more than 60 plus minutes of misdiagnosing duration, as well as effectiveness and quality. It's terrible. Um, completely horrific in terms of perceiving your own quality of sleep. If you look at the number of clinical sleep disorders, what you're going to see is like gigantic millions and millions of people, 30 to 50 million people in America have that. And over 80 plus percent of those are going to go undiagnosed. Yeah. No. And, and you know, the caffeine thing is is really problematic, right? As a physician, yeah. you drink a lot of, I mean, the majority of physicians drink coffee. And I will often tell people, do not drink afternoon. Like, I get it. You can't stop yeah. drinking coffee. I get it. I, I relate to that. But like, you have to stop. You have to drop that late coffee, even yeah. if you don't think it's going to affect your sleep. It is. Oh, definitely. And especially in high-performing people, I'll sleep when I'm dead or I don't need that much sleep. I mean, I hear that all the time. I only need a few hours. Yeah. And well, then you also only need to be okay. So you can't you can't talk out of both sides here, right? So like you're coming to me complaining about A, B, and C, and then you're also trying to tell me you don't need that much. So then I'm telling you, your system isn't working. Yeah. So do you want to try my system? Because yours isn't working. Right. If it was, we wouldn't be talking. So let's say you've optimized everything else as best you can. How do you determine the best aerobic, anaerobic, cardio resistance training that you can put together? Yeah, the number one thing is you start with your goal. What is it? If I'm, I'm trying to just be healthy, am I trying to lose fat? Am I trying to gain muscle? Am I trying to lose a little bit of fat and I want to feel stronger? I want to feel more energy throughout the day. We got to be really clear on what the actual goal is. After that, we got to be clear on the timeline. You got you have something you're going after eight weeks from now. Are you worried about longevity just 80 years from now? Is it eight months from now? Like, where are we at? That's going to determine specificity. The shorter the timeline, the more specific you should be. The longer the timeline, the more broad you can be with your approach, right? And what I mean is I've got a wedding. I have got some sort of charity run I'm going to do. Like I got this thing that's happening in this duration. Okay, great. If it's eight weeks away, we're pretty much going to do that activity, right? Like I want you doing that. Yeah. If you want to run a half marathon, we're going to run. Like that's what we're going to go do, right? If you're like, well, I want to incorporate running, but I'm really, I just, I want all these other benefits of exercise. Now we're going to step back and say, okay, awesome. It's much more nuanced than this, but just to give you something to grab onto here, six to 10 weeks should be like pretty focused and then maybe change. That's like a rough idea, right? It's like try to be fairly focused for a while on something and then you can move off. Where you want to avoid is I work out. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Like that is awesome. But then I'm not getting results. Okay, well, you're not getting results because you're working out. There's no intention here, right? The, the analogy would be like, you know, I live seven or so miles from here, right? Like yeah. we, we just learned this. We're yeah. neighbors, basically. And if I said, hey, you want to come over for dinner? And you're like, great. Yeah, you bring the family over. And I was like, okay, I just kind of live that way. If you drove a lot of time, you would get to my house. But if I gave you like my address, you would get right there with no missed turns and you would get there in seven minutes rather than potentially years down the road. Same thing. Do I know where I'm going specifically? Okay, great. Well, then let's go right there. If not, we're just wandering. Yeah. And you're probably getting closer to my house. Because I gave you like the direction. You might be there in seven minutes. You also might be there in seven hours, seven days, seven years. So we, we want a little more specificity. I, I would generally encourage people to be more specific because that's better than being more vague. Globally, I think people spend too much time doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. But at the same token, like rather than just like kind of going to the gym and like working out, most people would be better off saying, I'm just going to go buy a program, either hire a coach or Nowadays, you can buy training programs for $7, $10, $20. Like these are affordable things. And buy a specific program for a specific goal and do it. Yeah. And then see the results you get. Um, you'll be surprised how much better results people tend to get when you actually have a program. Rather than just sort of going to the gym and doing what you feel like doing. Yep. 
if I'm exercising for the purpose of like, man, I don't feel great right now. I just need to like work out. I don't need a plan. Yeah. Right? If I'm just like, hey, I like it. It's my free time. It's my personal time. It's my meditation. Awesome. But if you're trying to get an actual physiological outcome out of it, you're better off actually having a traditional program. And in terms of deciding a goal, a lot of people are like, I want to get swole or I want to lose weight, right? Those yeah. are like the two most common goals. Look good, feel good, play good. Right. How do you define like a goal within there, right? So what's a good example of a very specific goal? It really comes down to you, mm-hmm. right? What do you care about? Um, do you, I like it when my legs feel strong. Or I actually don't like it when my legs get too big. Okay, like I, I don't really particularly care. Uh, if, if you want to talk about, well, what are the traits you have to have as a healthy human? It's a little bit different. But in terms of the individual goal, picking something is going to win. And it doesn't honestly particularly matter what that was that is in the short term. So I would recommend if you like are sort of affluent about it, you're like, I don't really care. Like I can do different things. Then I would still just kind of run the gamut. Like pick a strength goal for a while. All right, and then pick an endurance thing. And then pick something like, oh man, I'm terrible at running. Great. Let's pick a running goal. And just making sure we're getting well-rounded inputs into our system. So as the years go on, we don't wake up and go, man, it's been 15 years since I've ran and I'm 40. That's not good. Yeah. Right? Like, that, oh, I have never, I haven't lifted weights. That's not good either. Like, and so we want to have a, uh, let's do some body weight stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I lift weights all the time. Great. Do you do any endurance? No. Do you have any control of your body? Never done yoga. Hmm. If you're just the well-rounded person now, like you're not so well-rounded. Yeah. So there's lots of ways. And so maybe we say, you know, we're going to pause or take our lifting down to two days a week. And we're going to just go do a Pilates class. Mm-hmm. As ridiculous as that might sound, right? Well, great. Do it. Because I promise you, you're going to learn a lot about your body and how you move than you are in your current setup and situation. So for that person, I would really strongly encourage doing a wide variety and throw all that stuff out the window during the summer mm-hmm. and just go surf. Yeah. Okay, great. That's my new training for the summer. And then in the wintertime, I'm going to go play indoor basketball and lift some weights and, and really have a variety. What I'm getting at is expanding your physical practice mm-hmm. and not thinking about it as just either run or lift weights. It's okay, totally in for that, but that's pretty limited. And also it would presumably prevent injury, right? You're not getting overuse injury Definitely. from running all the time or uh, lifting the same heavy weights and continuing to increase those weights yep. and possibly injuring yourself. 100%. So what we say is we don't ever want to stack volume on top of dysfunction. If your hips or your knees or your feet don't move perfectly, but you're not hurt right now, and but they move a little bit off, and now you stack a bunch of volume in the same movement pattern on them, and now all of a sudden, dang, that knee's starting to hurt. That low back is in pain. What's going on? I think I have arthritis. Uh, well... You generally have those things because you moved slightly off and you repeated that over time. So in terms of volume, let's talk a little bit about like the basics, right? Volume, intensity, power. What does that mean? How do people define that in terms of exercise? Yeah. So in terms of volume, we're typically looking at either things like distance covered in the case of running or swimming or cycling. You can think about it in terms of minutes, in terms of lifting weights. We're generally looking at the amount of repetitions you did per set multiplied by the amount of sets you did. Very basic math there, right? I did 10 repetitions in a row. I took a break. I did that three times. Three times 10 is 30. I did that for three exercises. 30 times three is 90. My volume is 90 today. That's an easy way to think about volume. Intensity can be defined in a couple of different ways. What you don't want to do generally is think about intensity as how hard, because that can be construed as skill. For example, go play golf. And if you don't know how to golf very well, you're going to be like, wow, that was really, really hard. But that's not intense, right? right? Same thing. Um, a marathon is not intense at all. Very hard, very fatiguing, very challenging, very all those words. It is very low intensity though because you have to go for two to six hours. So it has to be at a moderate to very low intensity from your cardiovascular physician perspective. And so again, you, being careful of saying like hard versus intense. Those are not necessarily the same thing. Skill, hard, fatigue, hard versus intense. So intensity tends to be things like what percentage of your one repetition maximum, so maximum strength, what percentage of your heart rate, what percentage of your VO2 max, what percentage of your speed, or it can be percentage of effort. That's fine, but just make sure we're not conflating those variables, right? So when you're talking to your trainer or you're talking to your doctor or your nutritionist or whatever, and you're using those terms, just be really clear about what you're saying. Like that workout was really hard. What do you mean hard? I couldn't figure out how to do that movement. It felt uncomfortable. If, uh, okay, that's different hard than like, Man, I was going to throw up and I was all, oh, okay, that's different. Also hard of like, I just, I was so bored. Those are different hearts to different people. And so just being really clear with your communication, um, just with even yourself, if you're coaching yourself, Mm -hmm. 
um, I don't understand what intensity means in that context. So in terms of intensity, what's the best way for someone to gauge? Is it heart rate? Is it someone who's not going into a lab and measuring their yeah. VO2 max, but you know, measuring your heart rate? Or is it measuring um, some calculator online that makes your VO2 max? <laughs> you know, what is, what is the best? You can, do, you can do any of those things. Yeah. So if you're lifting weights, we generally would say in resistance exercise type of stuff, it's percentage of your one rep max. If you don't know your one rep max, that's fine. You can think about another idea was called repetitions in reserve. It's another way of saying, okay, you lifted that thing six times. How many you think you could have done total? I think I could have done eight. Okay, so that means you left two in reserve. Okay, great. And so you can say, hey, uh, yeah, that exercise over there, when I put 50 pounds on it, all right, I, I got about six reps and I have two reps in reserve. So that's a rep in reserve. If I put 10 more pounds on it, I would only do it four. It's, you can kind of gauge it that way, right? So mm -hmm. how many left is one way to think about it. If you want to just go based on heart rate, that's fine too. It's not as good as some other stuff, but for general person, that's fine. Um, I really don't spend much time using either one of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, we think about things more like, can you do this thing while breathing through your nose only? Uh, this is Brian McKenzie and his uh, gear system, right? So if you can do this thing nasal only, that's gear two. If you have to go either nose and mouth or mm -hmm. mouth and nose, it doesn't matter, but you're using both, gear three. Mm -hmm. If you have to go straight up like, mouth in, mouth out, because you need so much volume, that's, that's gear four, right? That auto regulates a lot of stuff. And so I want to know like, oh, that was gear three. Okay, great. So that's a pretty easy way to just say like, okay, that's my intensity level one to four. And that's generally what we'll program. Hey, you're going to do this workout, whatever. This is how far you're going to go, how long you're going to go or whatever. And I want you in gear three, which means if you go to gear four, you got to slow down. You're going too hard, right? But if you're in gear two, not to that for most, most people. How does that relate to zones, right? We see a lot of zone, like, you know, the Peloton has zones, like all these sorts of things that like, get into zone two. If you're listening to this, I want you to hear my eyes rolling yeah. on that question. <laughs> hey, if you're watching, you, you saw it already. Um, I just going to be totally honest. I don't find a lot of value in zones. If you don't know your maximum heart rate, if you've never had that accurately tested, then those zones mean nothing to you because they're so variable yeah. in people, right? Imagine I gave you the same thing for lifting weights. And I said, okay, so for you, moderate is between 170 and 220 pounds. Yeah, that's not that's not possible. You, right. it, it is insane, right? And that changes every time you work out. I mean, not every time, but every few weeks or every few months. Well, it can literally change every day. Yeah. It can, right? Now, I'm being a little bit facetious there because the range of people's strength is much bigger than the range of people's heart rates. But you went from nonsensical to like, oh, okay, I see that there's problems here. So unless we know your actual heart rate, and there's no relationship between maximum heart rate and fitness. So my pro athletes might have a maximum heart rate of 175 beats a minute. We might have some of our least fit people whose max heart rates get 205. There's no relationship there. Or the inverse can happen too. So just arbitrarily designing zones. In addition, like who picked zone two cutoff versus zone three? I mean, I know the answer to these, but they're just like, they're not. Why is it four zones instead of it's five? not science-based. It is science-based, but it's still arbitrary. Yeah. It is science-based. It's yeah. not fake. Yeah. What it is is you run giant studies, right? And then you run statistical modeling and you usually use standard deviations. This is also, by the way, the problem why running any sort of blood work and interpreting the, where you're at based on reference ranges is a horrific idea. Yeah. Right? It, it tells you absolutely nothing for most people because you're working on a bell curve, which means we're saying uh, in giant studies, a thousand people, up to a million people, right? What, what does the world look like? Okay, 97% of people are on this bell curve. The last 2.5% over here, 95% rather, the last 2.5% are at the bottom, highest 2% on the other side. And if you are in the 95% in the middle, you're in the normal reference range. You're like, great. So if I'm the third percentile, I'm normal. That's the same words out from my doctor as if I'm in the 93rd percentile. Yeah. That is still normal. All right. So like here, this is, this is now a giant problem, right? And we don't, we're not really interpreting that. that. That's not the same person. That's not the same functioning yeah. person on those metrics. So you want to be really careful when paying attention to things like that. And the same thing could go back to our, our heart rate zone. Cause it's like, it's not arbitrary. It's not fake, Yeah. but it is just like a giant range of like, you're not dead. You're not like, you're not about to die too long. That's your goal. Yeah. So great job. You're not dead. Right. And this is all the way back to where you started this whole conversation was like, we want to be preventative a little bit, right? Yeah. Med medicine wants to be preventative. We don't do prevention. We further down that line, which is like, I, I don't care about prevention. You guys can ha handle prevention. I care about performing better. How do you perform at your absolute best, right? That's just what we spend our time on. So those numbers aren't good enough for me. So I don't care about someone decided there's three zones or four zones or five zones or six. I call it 16. I don't care. Mm -hmm. 
That doesn't mean anything to me. I'm going to coach you based on your physiology. I don't care about a made up zone. Like, I just don't. Are you loving the Rena Malik MD podcast? Well, I love each and every one of you, and I'm truly honored that you choose to spend a bit of your day or a bit of your week with me. Did you ever hear the actual story of why I started making content online? Well, when I was a resident, I remember having a patient who had bladder cancer. And in order to treat her bladder cancer, we had to remove it and then reconstruct a new bladder called an Indiana pouch. Now, with this new bladder, she would have to catheterize herself through a stoma or an opening on her abdomen in order to empty her bladder. So after surgery, immediately she did great. She went home and no major issues. But subsequently, over the next couple months, she started getting readmitted over and over again to the intensive care unit. And we were really wondering what was going on. Eventually, we figured out that she didn't truly understand that she now had to catheterize herself to empty her bladder. Just the simplest thing that was so pivotal, she didn't understand that. And it was then that I realized as a urologist, I could do the perfect surgery. But if my patient didn't understand the consequences of that surgery, then I failed as their doctor. And once I started practice, I realized that I couldn't teach people everything they needed to know in the 15 or 30 minutes I saw them in my office. And that's when I started creating all my Rena Malik MD content to offer free education to people around the world. And I can tell you that it has been truly one of the most rewarding experiences in my life. And in order to keep providing free content, we need your help. If you are getting value out of this podcast or my other content, I encourage you to join our premium membership. As a member, you'll get early access to the audio and video of the podcast completely ad-free, transcripts of all the episodes, and exclusive access to Ask Me Anything episodes that occur once a month. And during those episodes, I answer questions that are asked only by premium members. So join us today at renamalik.supercast.com. Can't wait to see you there. So say you're new to exercise and you start exercising and you choose a goal or so you did mention you know what is sort of the traits of a healthy person what what would you define as traits of a healthy person in terms of when they're trying to just be healthy what are things that you want to see in their exercise regimen outside of the stressors that we've talked about sort of reducing those so if we look at in order to stay alive what do we need to be able to do and we'll work backwards from there we talked about balance that's on my list right yep don't want to fall and we don't want to lose balance and all the other problems associated with that. All right, great. I need to have speed and power. We talked about that. Mm-hmm. I need to have strength. Mm-hmm. Okay, like I need to be able to go up, um, not only a flight of stairs, but you hate hiking. You want to go to the, like any number of things, right? Mm-hmm. Now, we talked a little bit about having some adequate amount of muscle. I don't need you to be giant or even close. I just can't have you insufficient. Or losing all that muscle. And that's the problem, right? You might be sufficient, and we deal with this a lot. You're 55 and you are sufficient now, but we know you're going to discontinue to lose muscle the rest of your life. So I can't have you at average. I have to have you at above average. Then I need to have some sort of metric of cardiovascular health, right? Look at VO2 max. Uh, as daunting as it is to have poor muscle mass with age, strength is probably a bigger predictor of all-cause mortality. VO2 max would be the closest equivalent to that. Uh, if you start looking at the data on clinical risk factors, chronic kidney disease, Smoking, diabetes, heart failure, AFib, all those things, right? None of those are good. Mm -hmm. And none of them come in the stratosphere of predicting all-cause mortality as VO2 max does. So how does someone measure, before you go on to that, how does someone measure their VO2 max at home if they don't have access to a lab? You can actually, so you can do maximal tests and you can do submaximal tests. These are both predictors. A ton of online calculators you can put yourself in. If you have a tracker or a wearable of some type, Mm -hmm. a lot of those give it to you. They're not super accurate, but they can ballpark you, right? What you're trying to figure out is like, are you terrible? Yeah. Or are you not terrible? Th- that is the biggest line of that. So it, when you look at, let's, let's give an example here. If you take like Jonathan Meyer's original work here, uh, uh, another Stanford person, Stanford got lucky there, two in a row, right? Um, his original data from like uh, the U.S. Veterans, yes, Veterans Hospital, right? So you take all those databases. So you're talking about studies with 750,000 people in them giant. And then over the course of these studies, 150, 175,000 people die. Mm-hmm. 
So these are phenomenal because the end metric is like who died and who did not. Right. Still epidemiology, yeah, get it, get it, get it, all the problems, but it's not a surrogate marker or a- Yeah, it's death. It's death, who yeah. died, right? And you take all these people and you run VO2 max tests on them in the lab, which they, they always do, right? Um, the VA, so I'm going to tease, holy cow, how do I forget the VA? And then you say, okay, let's break them into their either quartiles or quintiles. And, and right now I'm, I'm kind of covering a bunch of different papers, kind of smashing them just, just to get to a concept. And you look at the people that are in the lowest 20% or lowest 25% based on their VO2 max. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you look at what happens when you go from the lowest to just the second lowest category. Not good. Not even average. We are still below average, right? Okay. Yeah. So you are the bottom 20th percentile and you went up to the next category, which is below average. You're talking about a, usually the stratosphere of like a 2x reduction in, in risk of death. You've like, you, you've not gone up 5% or 10%. Like you have gone from a risk factor hazard ratio of 1.0, like at normal, you've gone to two. You've, you just cut it in half by just, you're still below average. If you go from below average to average, now you're talking about like 20%, 40% improvement. So good, huge. Mm -hmm. But nothing compares to just not being the absolute worst. Yeah. So you, you just have to be in that bottom category. Um, to give you some numbers here, I'll come back to your question about how to measure it in a second. I didn't lose that. If you look at VO2 max, we typically express this in what's called a relative term. So it's your VO2 max relative to your body weight. Yeah. So the units are milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. And how much action can you bring in and use divided by your body weight? So that's what the unit rate. So if you take somebody and my normal, you, you go to Fullerton, you come to campus, a uh, normal male, they're 40, mm -hmm. 45, normal female, a little bit lower, 38, mm -hmm. and something like that, ballpark. So that's average. Average, right? Think about VO2 max on a scale of 100. Okay. Like literally the highest we've ever seen was 98, something like that. Um, you go to the world championships in a marathon or Ironman or cross country skiing. These are going to be the eighties, high eighties, mid eighties, things like that. You go to an NBA game. You're looking at mid fifties, mid sixties, maybe a couple guys touching the seventy. Probably not though. Nobody below fifty. Probably different sports. Soccer's higher, et cetera, et cetera. And then general population, kind of like there. Okay, so that that's your scale. If you go below eighteen for men, and depending on the study, fifteen to sixteen for women. That's what we call the line of independence. Below that, it becomes very difficult to live independently by yourself. So your VO2 max of crossing below 18 for men, and again, about 16 or so, 15 for women, means you're going to have a very challenging time living by yourself because every single activity represents such a high percentage of your VO2 max. You are checking the mail, like going out and getting the mail out of your mailbox, is an 80% VO2 max effort. I mean, imagine every single thing, getting off the toilet is now a one at max, right? Like every single activity you do, you start being like, oh my gosh, if I fall down, I'm not getting back up, right? And so this is when like living independence goes away. You know, we started, one of the first things we started talking about, right? You people, yeah. you can't have a VO2 max that low. We know it drops with age just like muscle mass does. And so whether you are 20, 50 or 60 or 70 right now, if you're looking at getting a test done, figuring out where you're at, no matter what that number is, higher is only better. And all the research, I've never seen any paper that indicates, in fact, all of them specifically indicate the opposite here, which is there's no upper limit to benefit. Muscle size, okay, at some point, it's not going to make you any healthier, right? Mm -hmm. If you can back squat 350 pounds, and now I can make you back squat 400 pounds, I don't think you're going to live any longer. Yeah. But VO2 max just, just goes up. The higher that number is, the more protective it is. There's no tapering. There's no benefit. There's no asymptote here just keeps going. So when you're looking at your stuff and you're interpreting your, your data, if you're thinking, oh, okay, I'm not bad right now. Well, you got to project in the future. We know you're going to lose roughly about 1% per year, plus or minus, right? Um, mm -hmm. But that accelerates after 50. Mm -hmm. And so you want to think about like, depending on the study you want to pull, something like 7% loss per five years, kind of on average, like roughly, yeah. right? Like if you want to even make it easier, 1% per year, right? doesn't really sure. matter. And if you're thinking, okay, I'm not too bad. I'm 35 mm -hmm. milliliters per kilogram per minute, and you're 50 years old. Well, let's start learning some basic math here. It's like, well, let's take 1% off per year. How many years until you get below 18? Not that many. Not that many. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, you are fine now at 50, but you're not going to be living by yourself at 75. Ooh. And now you want to like, you, you want to do a training program when you're 70? Yeah. No, it's, it's much harder. It's way, like you totally can do it, right? But you, yeah. you see my point. Yeah. 
So when you look at that number, like whatever that number is, the goal is going to be make it higher. And that's the, through endurance. Totally. Yeah. But it can, you can come, like the method you pick to do it is irrelevant. You have to pick anything that's going to challenge your heart. Mm -hmm. But you need to be paying attention to that metric because that, that's going to ultimately matter. It's going to continue to matter. And, and so this is one of the most important things in terms of overall global health to pay attention to. Um, it's frustrating that it is not a basic part of medical coverage. Like to me, I get a lot of people won't do it, which is a different conversation. But man, like you're just not going to find anything in the world that tells you more about how long you're going to live than your grip strength, your leg strength, and your VO2 max. Sorry, I forgot how to test it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me answer that question. So if you want to do a max test or a sub-max test, nothing is going to be as accurate as actually going and do a full max test on a metabolic heart. Now, the cool part is these are popping up all over the place. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one, turns out, that knows these data. And so people are seeing the importance of it. People are agreeing with me. And all of our programs work remote, by the way. So none of our programs require an office visit. So we have people all over the country, and we put them all in. We find a place that can do a VO2 max test on them. So all of our athletes and clients get a VO2 max test done. So you might have to go for a little bit of a hike, but they're, they're, honestly, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere between 50, 200 bucks, typically, which is not nothing. Investment in your life, though, right? But come on. Investment in mortality, investment in ability to get off the toilet when you're 70, maybe it's worth it. Relative to how other ways you can spend $100, if you have $100 and some don't even have 100 Right. I get it. I was there. A lot of people do who would still say it's too much, and I think- No question. Uh, a lot of people have $600,000 and say 100 is too much. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, so you can do that. Um, if you don't have anything like that, though, you can do a couple different things. If your tracker has it, that's going to give you a rough idea. You can do a, a max test. Uh, there's a- bunch of them. There's there's dozens of them that have been scientifically validated. An easy one is a Cooper 12-minute test. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is you can basically go to a track and you can run for 12 minutes as far as you possibly can. You record that distance. Mm -hmm. You take that distance, you plug it into an online calculator, and it will tell you your, your estimated VO2 from there. If you can't run or you're like, I'm not comfortable going that hard, I don't know, you can do two-minute submax tests. Mm -hmm. These are things you can do, uh, especially as practitioners or clinicians. You get a very low box, like 12-inch box. I can't remember exactly what it is. Yeah. And you take their heart rate, um, and you have them step up and down that box for two minutes, and then you take their heart rate at the end. And you can use that, how high how hard, high their heart rate. And I think you use a metronome, too, to keep them like, on a certain pace. Sure. I haven't done this in 20 years. It's like in every undergrad class. <laughs> but I'm like, I don't remember. Um, and you can use that, plug that in, and get a, like an evaluated thing. So it's, it's a submax test. It takes two minutes. It's pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward, yeah. And it gets you close. So that grip strength, and what was the other thing that you said? Leg strength. Leg strength. Grip strength is something I think we don't talk about enough. I talk about it a lot. I love it. <laughs> no, I'm saying as a whole. Yeah. Um, how do you assess grip strength, and how do you get to better grip strength? Yeah, super easy. Uh, you can buy on Amazon a hand grip dynamometer. Mm -hmm. 20 to $50, depending on the one you get there. It's a little machine. You can squeeze it and look at the number, and it'll tell you in either pounds or kilograms what you want to do. Strongly encourage to have that apart if you have any if you're a health coach of any kind md or not like and you're working with people that it's even athletes like you want to know this data but there are a ton of publications the last couple of years that give reference ranges mm -hmm. for hand grip dynamometers for men for women by age demographic so every five year split mm -hmm. as well as dominant non-dominant hands those are open access papers so you can have those up we use them all the time right it's like mm -hmm. okay here you are yeah um, this is what percentile you're in can, it can, and those are very good. Um, in terms of the number you want to typically be at, for men, like I always want to see over 50 kilos. Mm -hmm. uh, for women, 40. Depends on age and things like that, right? So I, I want decent grip strength. Not as egregious, but similar to my comments about um, blood reference ranges. I don't love the reference ranges for grip strength. I think they're undershot. Mm -hmm. I think you should be more aggressive than that. Or, but they're not unreasonable like many of the reference ranges for blood for biochemistry. is. So they're just all egregious. Now, a lot of people will talk about grip strength and they're like, oh, it's not a core, it's, not, it's correlation, it's not causation. So, yeah. which is to say, like, it's an indicator of overall health, but it doesn't really matter itself. And I would say there is so much evidence to argue that. Uh, in fact, even more recently, a colleague of mine, uh, Tommy Wood at the University of Washington, we published a paper this year, a couple of them. He published one as well. Um, and when you look at grip strength, there is a strong indicator here. In fact, actually, another paper came out just recently on asymmetry. 10%. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at right hand versus uh, left hand. Um, that makes sense. Dominant versus non-dominant. Yeah. We typically have thought of it as like, well, your, your, your dominant hand is going to be stronger. And it yeah. is. 
But the issue they found there is when you have people that have more than a 10% asymmetry, this is a potential, and it's just one paper, which always means like, let's see if it's replicated. Data, yeah. Let's see if it comes from another lab as well. Like you're, you've published, you, yeah. you're a scientist, you know. So don't be, but to me, it makes a ton of sense. But that 10% difference, when you start seeing greater than a 10%, you have an early indicator of some neurological denervation happening. So it's not just a random like, well, of course you're, you're a grip, your dominant hand stronger. It is and should be. But if you, and we've seen this in our in our practice a lot, you know, people 20, 25, 30% differences in grip strength. Mm -hmm. Either you have some injury in that hand that, you know, you hurt your hand a long time ago, or something else is going on. Um, and you don't want to have that. So we pay attention to that number at 10%. In terms of training, it's super easy. Do anything. The challenge is grip. Just a squeezy ball. Sure, if you want. Yeah. Deadlift. Push things, drag things, carry things, hold things, use dumbbells, um, use kettlebells, any number of things that challenge. Physiology is very straightforward in from the perspective of adaptation, meaning we always say, like, look for the physiological limiter. The physiological limiter is also the place of adaptation. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing anything where your grip gives out and you're limited by your grip strength, it's then challenging your grip strength. It will adapt. You'll get stronger. So it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, again, if you're if you're lifting weights and you're doing rows, mm -hmm. pulling things to you, if you're using a machine and you're using straps on your wrist, well, now you're actually not limiting your grip strength at all. Mm -hmm. Great for your upper back. Great for your potential biceps. Uh, awesome. But you're not challenging your grip. Not challenging your grip. What if you wear gloves? Gl gloves are fine, but now you're taking a little bit of grip away. Yeah. But still could possibly be doing it, right? Um, not against that entirely, although I have to be totally honest with you. Most of my soul dies when I see somebody using gloves. Really? Yeah, but I'm like, this is this is cultural, okay? I'll, I'll grant you that's not logic. That's just like, you don't wear gloves in the gym. You actually, you wrote a paper I read um, briefly about, you can actually epigenetic changes in response to resistance training. Oh, yeah. So talk a little bit about that. Like, how does that affect you as a, as a, as a, your physio physiology? Epigenetics is an emerging field, and by that, like it's been around twenty-ish years in, in sort of its current form, which is new in science. Right? Like that's yeah. a that's a new it thing. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we we did one particular study, and we looked at the epigenetic responses in muscle uh, following an acute bout of exercise. We did it in very sedentary people compared to people that are uh, well trained. And what we're trying to see there is we know that there's a certain response in muscle or any organ system to challenge, but is that uniquely different between the two? The paper itself doesn't matter. The your better your question was better, which is okay. Like, how does that actually matter? So epigenetics, you have to understand them a little bit. When we went back earlier, we were talking about genetics. Genetics are very important mm -hmm. for a lot of different things, of course. In terms of actionable steps, though, they are the least important part of the process because they only tell you about potential. They don't tell you about actualization. Genes mean nothing unless they're turned on. Mm -hmm. That's epigenetics. Okay, so how are they? This is a condensed, sort of easy version of epigenetics. So um, you can do a genetic test, and there are some things you can glean out of that, and there's a bunch of things that don't matter at all because they don't tell you anything about did they actually net result in protein? Do you actually did you make that enzyme? Did you not make that? You don't know. You just knew about sort of unless you find things that are clinical, um, genetic markers for genetic. This is what they call genetic diseases, right? Yeah. Like different things there. Um, or other factors that say, hey, your higher chances, lower chances of A, B, and C. But unless you actually look at the thing, you don't know if that chance made it or not, right? So epigenetics, some of those things can be carried from generation to generation. Many of them don't. Most acute things like with exercise are probably not going to carry over mm -hmm. to the next generation. In this particular case, like none of that stuff would. Yeah. We were just trying to understand, is that response unique? And if so, how? Uh, it was one of the first in the field. And so it was more of a descriptive than it was an actual intervention. Mm -hmm. In terms of someone starting exercise, as just, let's say, general exercise, they're doing some resistance, some cardio that's actually challenging them. Um, how quickly will they see benefits? Within weeks, within months, within years? And, and what sort of differences will they see? Yeah, so it depends on how we want to define benefit. If you're trying to get stronger, how fast will it take before you actually notice changes on the bar? Can be as soon as the next test session, like depending on how trained you are. Mm -hmm. The less trained you are, the faster you'll see changes. The more trained you are, the slower that stuff happens. Mm -hmm. um, so like, in fact, this is 
in the field we call these newbie gains. Yeah. They're like really, f- <laughs> they're like, oh my God, I got. Yeah, it's like literally every time you go to the gym, you could put five more pounds on and you just yeah. continue to, to go up there. If there are other changes you're looking for, like when am I going to start losing weight? When is my, when is my pain going to go away? When am I going to start having better energy? That can be, again, a day, could be a month, could be six months. It really depends on a lot of the things that are going on. But yeah, you, you can certainly see changes. In terms of muscle size, uh, the number you're going to see there, and this is just very general science, typically the first four or so weeks of training, mm-hmm. most of the adaptations are neural, meaning we can't yet, we don't have the precision of imaging yet to identify a statistically significant change in like muscle fiber size though it's clearly happening. It just hasn't reached a threshold where we could notice it. And so if you're continuing to get strong at that point or whatever, it's probably because yeah, you're getting more efficient, nervous systems being there. After that, now we can actually start measuring changes in muscle size. But again, that said, you go do a training session right now. Muscles can be larger for acute reasons, swelling, edema, things like that. Mm-hmm. And two weeks later, like you could actually have legitimate changes in muscle size. Again, it's mostly water, but if you continue at it, it'll stay there and you won't be able to tell the difference from when it turns from water to contract all proper proteins anyways. Interesting. And is it different? I, you know, they say that it's much more difficult for women to gain muscle, particularly after menopause, right? But it, is it different? Is there actually science behind it? Well, they say that, but they're not right. It's not true. No. <laughs> We're debunking myths here. No, you actually know there's another paper came out um, in the last couple of months that's the same thing for people over 70. There's, there's no difference in rate of improvement. Really? No. I don't know if you know this or not, but women have testosterone. Oh, I know. Did, did you I'm, know I'm that? I'm a urologist. I know. I was totally joking, right? <laughs> like, you, you're all over this one, right? Yeah. And it turns out you have a lot more testosterone than, than you even have estrogen. Yeah. Yeah, weird, right? Yeah. Uh, people just think, like, it's nuts. To that to say, women are completely anabolic, mm-hmm. just like men are. You would be in a bad place if you were not anabolic. So there, there's just not any evidence to suggest the rate of increase really changes between men and women. Um, you said it earlier perfectly. Men are absolutely bigger, generally. Yeah. So when you're both doing relative changes of the same percent and one is absolutely larger, you have absolutely more, generally, massive. Yeah. But the rate of increase doesn't seem to change. If you want to look at function, too, look at the sport of powerlifting. Look at the sport of Olympic weightlifting. Look at any of these strength-based one rep max sports, and you see women continuing to progress in those sports like men are, and there's no reason to think that. We're continuing to break world records on both sides of the equation, and they're scaling. So, there's yeah, there's no, no rationale to think that. Women just tend to be smaller. Yeah, and that's physiologic. Totally. So That's, that's chromosomal. Like, yeah. You can tell yeah. that from chromosomes. Yeah. Let's say, let's just talk about designing. This was actually a question from one of my audience. Designing the optimal regimen for someone who's got 20 minutes a day, Yeah. let's say for fat loss as the primary goal, and yeah. then for muscle hypertrophy as the primary goal. 20 minutes a day every day, or three days a week, or what do we got? Let's say five days. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's just say that. Let's say they had five days. If I had 30 minutes, I would probably do at least one day where that is what we call like gear one. So this is mouth closed, and you're breathing in and out through your nose at a controlled pace. I don't care what you're doing. This could be walking. This could be whatever. But we're going to be doing that lower end of the threshold. One of those days, I would certainly do at least one day that's the opposite, gear four. Um, This could be intervals. This could be things like that. But we are going to burn as many calories as we can possibly do in an up-down fashion in there. Um, I would certainly do two days a week without question of some sort of what we call kind of like general hypertrophy range lifting. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, sets of eight to 20 repetitions, plus or minus, something like that, um, where we're, we're pushing the pace on what would feel we're doing whole body every time. We're not doing body part splits or okay. things like that, right? So you're going to do upper body push and pull. You're going to do lower body press and pull, and we're going to do whole body movements, right? We're going to get you moving throughout the day. Um, that gives me four days a week, right? Um, the additional day, I might add either a continuous. So this would be maybe something that's more like gear two or gear three, where it's still the 20 straight minutes, um, jogging, swimming, aerodyne, something like that, it is higher intensity than the previous one. Um, but this is not like fall on the floor, sweat, throw up, things like that, right? Uh, it would probably be something like that as a s- stamp. And then from there, we would personalize and individualize it. And then walking's not enough. You can't just walk for all of your cardio. Uh, for fat loss? Yeah. You could. You could. The, the exchange is how much ground are you covering in that 30 minutes? Not much. So caloric expenditure is very low. 
So you, you could do that, but you would have to then pull more calories from food to get that balance correctly. But you absolutely can. Not the best strategy to just like walk, but it's also not a zero strategy. If you look at people who are in aesthetic sports, bodybuilders, physique, and things like that, you will see them add a lot of walking mm -hmm. because it's the, here's, here's why. When you're thinking about designing exercise programs, people tend to think about the front side, the input. They don't think about the output, which is to say you have to pay attention to what's called recoverable volume. So if I, in that, in that program I gave you, if I just said, hey, we're, great, we're going to do 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, hard as you possibly can for 30 seconds, 30 seconds of rest, mm -hmm. and we're going to do that for all your workouts. That's the most calories you could possibly build. And you would be smashed after that. Yeah. Because once you get past like 80% uh, intensity, recoverability does not go linear. It goes exponential. So going from 85 to 90 is way harder to recover from than going from 55 to 60. Going from 95 to 100 is way, way harder to recover from than going from 80 to 85. So this is this, this starts really, really digging into recoverability. Now, if you're doing that once or twice a week, it's fine. You got the recovery capacity. If this is all you're going after and the rest of your buckets are already pretty full of stress and you're not like empty, you don't have much left to go. And so it's like, okay, be careful there. If everything is dialed, you can get away with that. And we're talking low volume, fine. But if not, you don't want to do that because the recovery is so hard to get to. You're going to get now super hungry. You're going to have a hard time sleeping. You're going to get these swings of like, oh my God, I feel exhausted. I finished my workout and I'm completely crashed. Okay. I'm trouble sleeping, having fall, trouble fall time sleeping at night. And my motivation, like all these things start kicking in, like these signs and symptoms of like, this is a stressed physiology, your respiratory rate. Like this is the biggest give me. Pay attention to respiratory rate. This will tell you like it's the canary in the coal mine. Like sure. how often you breathe per minute. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just, just for people who don't know what it is. Totally. Like this is a great way to pay attention. In fact, like I'll argue this is respiratory rate and over breathing is, is one of the most underappreciated metrics of health and physiology. Um, it'll tell you everything about what's happening. So if it's too it. high, your recovery is compromised. Well, if it's too if it's too high, you have a number of problems. Okay. Um, so over breathing is a huge issue. Um, this will induce very quickly what's called respiratory alkalosis, mm -hmm. which will then be compensated by with metabolic acidosis, and now we're running into a whole cascade of issues. Um, yeah, over breathing is is a significant problem health wise, like a ton of reasons, um, but even performance wise. So that's the problem. I would, I would just be like, hey, go hell's bells, go do kettlebell circuits, go do whatever every single time, but recovery, you have to pay attention to that side of the equation. Walking is the opposite. Recovery ability is perfect. Yeah. In fact, it's probably like it's plus 100%, right? Mm -hmm. We know low level activity like that adds to recovery. You're feeling really trashed and beaten down. Go for a 20 minute ride at 100 beats per minute, something like that. Walk, like something not zero, and you'll feel actually better than you were before. So it's like a plus. It's a 100 plus thing, right? Downside, if you, you capped me with time, that was your question, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're not going to burn enough calories. Yeah. So if you go that in the equation, it's like, okay, you're going to feel awesome, but you're not getting much work done. And so the program I gave you had both. You notice that first thing I started off with that like low intensity walking mm -hmm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, there's got to be something in there. Awesome. Then I went high intensity, mastered with that. And then I thought, okay, we got to have some lifting in there that's a little bit in between. But then I may or may not want to add either one more low intensity one or at most a kind of like moderate intensity one. Probably for most people, that second one would be a, a lower intensity one. So that would be for fat loss. Optimally. Totally. And then what about for muscle hypertrophy? Muscle hypertrophy, you pretty much stick to the lifting, right? You stay in that range. If you got four days a week, I might do something like a what's called a push-pull. Mm -hmm. So day one, you're doing all pushing exercises, right? So this could be upper body and lower body. Day two, you're doing all pulling exercises. If you want to do like an upper body, lower body split, mm -hmm. that's great. So upper body... Day two, you know, et cetera, et cetera, four days a week. I would stick to something like that. If you still wanted to add the extra day as a low intensity walk, I probably would, but the the conditioning pieces can go away. In terms of VO2 max, though, we need to have some cardiovascular endurance. Yep. So while you obviously your goal is hypertrophy, but your uh, okay. overlying like life goal is to maintain your VO2 max. Great. Here's what I'd say then pick what you really want to pay attention to. So, Optimizing VO2 max and muscle hypertrophy are going to be a little bit competitive. What you probably want to do is say, hey, look, I'm going to focus on hypertrophy for eight weeks. That's just what I'm going to do. I'm not going to also try to make adaptations in my VO2 max. Got it. Because they're competing. Now, at the same time, then, if you then go and do program design talk, this would be linear periodization. So one goal at a time. Then if you want to go focus on VO2 max, eight weeks of that. But the problem with that is then you've gone, say in the case, you spent eight weeks trying to get big. 
and then you didn't do anything to keep that muscle mass for two months, yeah, it goes away. And so what's an uh, exchange of linear periodization, uh, you can use what's called undulating periodization. So this is multiple goals at once. There's lots of different forms of this. These undulating linear are just two examples of many different approaches to it. But this would say, okay, great. Let's do them both. But we're going to change how much time we spend on each based on what our priority is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's another vertical integration style of this, but let's say this. I'm going to go through eight weeks, and I want to get a lot of muscle growth but I don't want to lose my VO2 max. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't want it to go down. It's not going to go up a ton. Right, but you want to maintain it. Maintain. So you're not losing it. Great. That 5%, you're saving that 5%. Totally. Sure. In that particular case, I do years. one day a week of the lower intensity stuff, and then I do one day a week of the higher intensity stuff. That's going to be enough for most people to keep you exactly where you're at. Now, we get to our next eight-week session, and we switch. Now, we optimize for VO2 max, and we keep two days a week to maintain our muscle mass. And so we're just playing a little bit of a shift there. That's not enough to really compete with the other one that much. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm getting a little bit tired, a little bit sore from my lifting. So I'm going to take that down to one day of lifting a week and then one day of 70% lifting where I'm just getting a pump, lower light weight. So we're going sets of 25, sets of 30, body weight, really, really low, getting a really big pump, but nothing that's going to make me sore the next day or at all. And then I'm getting out of there. So then in terms of health, yep. it's probably good to get a combination of those things, right? Some via, some endurance training at some point yep. and, and incorporating that either higher at some points and lower at other points. Yep. And then in terms of the other things can be based on your goals. Yep. So what I would recommend doing is, again, you want to think of this year by year. Don't just think about it as like what the work I'm doing right now. If you can run a full analysis on everything, get your strength tested. Get your VO2 max tested. Get your body composition tested. Get your bone mineral density tested. Get all these things, right? Pick the one that's the worst. What is the lowest score? Go after that year one. Oh, by the way, could be balance. Could be injury. Could be I have this pain going on. Could be every time I do this, this hurts. That gets to be number one. Right. If you're between age of 30 and 70, that's always number one year goal. It doesn't mean you're not lifting. doesn't mean you're not doing endurance work. It's just what's the priority. So that gets three days a week and everything else gets to share two days a week. Mm -hmm. Or whatever the case is, right? You're not doing nothing. I'm not just saying go stretch for a year. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's ridiculous, right? Yeah. But this is just our priority. It's not our singular thing, right? It's just our top priority, right? All right, so we're making sure we get that done. Now, once we check that box off, we go, okay, what's the next worst thing? Next worst thing is our bone rail density. Okay, great. Let's do a program design on that. Got that checked off. Now, and then you just continue to do that. And if you do that in this particular day, I was going to say you had four huge issues. Four years later, this is it, which sounds like a lot, but it's also nothing. It's not. It's if you're like 40 yeah. or 60, and all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, if I could take away all your physical problems, by the time you're 65, you're like, sign me up. Now you're 65, and you can do anything you want. If you are really weak to start off with, are there certain things you should do to avoid injury? Yeah. Or sometimes people will say, like, engage your core, right? And people are like, I don't even know what that is, right? Like, <laughs> and, and so there's a lot of, I know, the things like muscle-mind connection when you're, yeah, yeah. you know, like, how can you sort of foster that when you're yeah. starting out? Again, you may or may not be aware, but, like, engaging your core is not always a great idea. All right. No. It debunked uh, so many myths here. Um, <laughs> I swear to God, I haven't watched a video uh, or a class online that doesn't say engage your core. <laughs> well, I actually disagree. I mean, I've heard you say it a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. Like pelvic floor is not just like squeeze everything. Oh, no, I agree. I, I completely agree with that. I'm yeah. saying, but like engage your core mean. in the sense of like. I was being dramatic right there. there. Yeah. I was being dramatic. <laughs> what I mean by that is just squeezing harder is not necessarily the right answer. Right, that, that's not the solution we want to meet. So you want to move well. Mm -hmm. What's that mean? Well, your joints all go through a certain range of motion. Different joints do different things. Um, this is not a perfect analogy, but this is a very easy, quick one. There's a thing that, uh, called the joint by joint approach, mm -hmm. okay? Again, it's not perfect, but it's a nice concept here, which says some joints are supposed to be stable and some joints are supposed to be mobile and they tend to flip. So we just go from the bottom up, okay? Your ankle is supposed to be very mobile. Mm -hmm. Your knee is then stable. So then your hip can be mobile. Mm -hmm. So your lumbar can be stable. So your thoracic can be mobile. So your cervical can be stable. So your shoulder then can be mobile. Mm -hmm. So your elbow can be stable. So your wrist can be mobile. Mm -hmm. That's how it is, right? And so if, for example, your core and your lumbar is not stable, Okay, if it's unstable and we're getting movement out of our lumbar, mm -hmm. it's not supposed to be a mover. Now I'm having low back pain, right? right? Why did I have, why was my low back 
mobile instead of stable because something above it or below it that's supposed to be mobile was probably too tight or stable or whatever the case is, right? You, it just could be a number of different things. So I had tight hips. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a tight thoracic spine. So when I went to move, I couldn't move there. And so I found movement by getting my low back. Where you weren't supposed to be. Bingo. Right. Same thing, right? You ever heard of people who have knee pains because they have ankle dysfunction, mm -hmm. right? So I went to go through ankle flexion extension, right? This is called dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. And I got to the end of that range of motion and my, and my ankle wouldn't go any further. Mm -hmm. And so in order to get that position, my knee moved inward, valgus move as we call it, so that I could actually go forward. I'm squatting, running, right. whatever the case is, right? And now all of a sudden my knee is moving off track. And now I've got knee pain or hip pain or to compensate for that, I move my hip in a different spot. Hip. And now I have hip or back pain, Yeah. right? And now actually because of that, that led up to my shoulder blades and now my neck's hurting. Why? Because my hips were out of position. And in order for me to not be facing the floor, I lifted my neck up in the air. You can see how it's going. Oh, that's so important, right? And, and when you have an injury, it can make you feel pain in other areas. Always. Abnormality, right? And that's what we see that, as you know, in, in urology and pelvic floor dysfunction, we will see Constantly. so much back pain, uh, even hip pain, hip issues, or hip issues can lead to pelvic floor dysfunction. But either way, yep. um, it can create a whole host of issues and people have no idea. Well, I mean, the pelvic floor is such a good example, right? Because if you've got, say, adductor, uh, so your groin mm -hmm. dysfunction there, if you've got quadricep dysfunction, right? And now your knee and or hip are in the wrong position and you're trying to inertly s search for stability mm -hmm. and you get that by contracting really hard in your pelvic floor to yep. stabilize your pelvis, mm -hmm. Now you've created a whole bunch of problems. And now we have urinary problems, sexual dysfunction, back pain, you name it. We've got it. Tons of them, right? Urine pain, yeah. Yep. And that could have, in some cases, been caused by actually dysfunction at your knee or ankle, whatever they So case, how could right? someone assess their form or their posture or their movements to yep. make sure they're not in that situation? So the, the really short answer is just think about each one of your joints. It should be going through that full range of motion, and it should be doing it without compromising the joint above and below. That's the basics. Human movement is really, really simple for the most part. Your feet are supposed to be forward-ish. Mm -hmm. Don't need to be super like perfectly forward. Okay, great. Your knee should track over your toes-ish. You should be able, actually four easy criteria, joint by joint, super simple, right? You should be able to go through a full range of motion without making other joints move. Like that's what it'd be normal. It should be stable. So if I ask you to squat down and your knee can go all the way down, but it shakes uncontrollably, it's not stable. You're, as soon as you get tired, put load on or go fast. Now you do that over time. Dysfunction is, you can even do it with your body weight. That's a problem. You should be aware. A lot of movement dysfunction is simply like, hey, did you know that your, your right toe's pointing that way and your left toe's pointing that way? Oh, shoot. It's not a tightness. It's not a mobility restriction. It's yeah. not, it just didn't have any idea, right? And then it should be symmetrical. The right knee should be doing what the left knee is doing. The right side of the hip should be doing the same thing, like front, back, left to right, all those things. If you just go joint by joint and watch yourself move. So you're doing a bench press. Okay, great. What are your feet doing? What are your knees doing? What's your back doing? Is your low back stable? If it's not, okay, great. Move yourself up the chain. Then go to your shoulder, your elbow. Like my shoulder and elbow should be going through a normal range and position, right? You'll be able to see that. You'll be able to see one elbow's flaring. It's shaking as you're going up, right? The barbell's twisted. These things tend to present themselves pretty well. If you watch somebody run, take like everyone's cameras go in high def now, like slow motion, like watch. Are their knees over top of their toes? Roughly-ish, right? Like are they in really bad positions? Is their pelvic completely, is their stomach way out in front of their, of their center of mass? Like you'll notice many of these things um, at the highest level. So just thinking about that, is going to put you in the right position for the most part. Um, you know where your neck should be relative to your shoulder blades. Mm -hmm. Like we know where these things should be. I, a really easy one, if you stand and, and just stand up straight up and down, you don't have to do this right now, but you at home can. Just stand up, right? Let your hands relax. If your thumbs are touching, we know we have shoulder problems, right? Your hands are supposed to be splayed open. Yeah. Right? Like they're not, your thumbs shouldn't be pointing at each other. They should be pointing away. Not like necessarily 90 degrees away. But there's that laser, imagine if there's a laser coming off your thumb. Mm -hmm. It should probably cross out in front of you in some distance. Yeah. But that distance shouldn't be like six inches in front of you. <laughs> because that means your thumbs are pointing at each other. Yeah. You're in a little shoulder-fold position. Yeah. So that's, the, that's a very easy way to describe 
um, technique. So we should be training over our full range of motion most of the time, unless it's causing significant compromises in other joints and don't do that. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, those are the defaults. And then breath work. Right. Breath work is super important. Yep. I've talked about it before in terms of pelvic floor stability, but mm -hmm. maybe you can talk about it in general. How should we be breathing? Because I find a lot of people breath holding right? yep. or or breathing erratically when they're doing exercise. Yeah, there's a really nice This will actually tie back in. Um, have you done much work in um, with DNS? Stuff, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization? No, not. Th it's actually very recently becoming a part of our, um, there's some data on it in terms of mm -hmm. pelvic floor now, but uh, it's not something that we've been really, that's really talked about. It's not clinical yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, that you're not going to find much data on in there. I have found it to be very uh, helpful. Look, this is one of the, we've been in breath work for a long time, and this is one of the major problems with it. Breath work is not breathing your belly. Like belly breathing is better than clavicular breathing, but that's not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's not just move your belly up and as far out as possible. So the reason I bring up DNS is it's, it's, it's great to think about your entire core in four major quadrants. So if you take your belly button, right, and you go to your, uh, your right side, mm -hmm. okay, and you think of that as like belly button to right side, that entire column is one. Belly button to left side is another column. The same thing in the back, mm -hmm. right? So if you know your anatomy, your ASIS in the front and your PSIS in the back, right? Posterior, superior, leg, spine, up there. But your your spine all the way to your left hip is kind of that back left column and your spine to your right hip is your back right column. So think of them, I'm saying columns on purpose. Think of the, the vertical cylinders that are there. If you're trying to brace your core by just focusing on the front half of your body and not the back half of your body, we're not fully braced here, right? We have four doors in our car and the front two are locked, but the back two are open. What, what what's going to happen? Yeah. Not good, right? Yeah. Same thing with our back. Now, what a lot of people do is they reach stability of all four by compensation somehow. And so in the world of DNS, this is things like, imagine really arching your back really, really hard, right? And so people say things like, get tight, get tight, get tight, like brace your back. Okay, I, I don't want you to be really, really rounded mm -hmm. while you're lifting. That's very clear. I also don't want you to be overly extended. Right. So imagine now your back two cylinders, so back right and back left, are really strong and tight, tight and strong. But my front side is now sloppy and loose. It's the same problem, just in reverse. It just needs to be... We want all this. four on. Yeah. We want all four columns going. And so the very easy way to do this is take your pointer finger and put it in your belly button and move it just out to the right an inch or two. Right? Now you should be able to move with just your core. Right, your fingers should be able to visibly move. I can. I'm talking. I'm doing this right now. None of you can see this. Not even you can see this on camera. But I can talk and move this very noticeably. Right, your core. Yeah, by just using my core, which means I'm able to activate quadrant one and two, if you will. Now, take my fingers and go directly to my side. Right now, it's gonna be a little bit harder to see this, but you can see this. Right. And you're talking many inches of movement while I'm talking. I'm having control of my diaphragm. I can still breathe while bracing my core. I don't have to go. A brace trip. Like <laughs> yeah. That's not good either, right? Yeah. No humans do that. That's fine if you're doing like a one or a max deadlift. Right. But if you want to be able to brace your core while you're running and you can't breathe, I don't need full lockdown. I just need activation. Now, the really tricky one is you take that entire same thing and you do it behind you. Mm -hmm. So just above on your spinal column there, and you should be able to do the same thing. You can't see it from this angle. My back's back there. But contract. Now, that's very low. 75% of people can do the first one, belly button. 50% mm -hmm. can do the side, and very few people can do the back. If you can't do the back, that means we're not bracing those back two columns. So we want to make sure that all four of those are at least on somewhat level. I don't want to get my stability here through what's called a compression strategy, which is just arching my low back as hard as I possibly can, getting overly tight, because mm -hmm. now I'm doing the same thing to the spine that I am when I'm rounding it, but in reverse. Right. Now, rounding of it, if I had to pick... I'd, I'd like you to be a little more extended than flex. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't you know, be super rounded. But that, that is like one easy example of it. So a very, very, very easy thing to do for people. Just take your hands, your left and right hand, and make an L with your thumb and your pointer finger. And take that and put it on your side, right? Just imagine we were trying to like put a cylinder with your hands and I'm trying to squeeze and push down your, like I was trying to measure your, your uh, rib cave. Yeah, and, make, and I wanted it as small as possible. And if you can just take that and just move it out a little bit, and that's going to tell you if you're on. 
And so when I, when I teach kids this, it's like, put that on and now do a squat. Now do a hinge. Now do a step up. Now do whatever you're going to do. Do a vertical jump. And don't lose that whole thing. Again, I don't want it to be like lockdown city here. It's not a one rep max of your core every time you stand up. Yeah. It's just got to be, give me 20%. Kelly Starrett says 20, 20%, 25%, like something like that, right? Yeah. And that's a nice racing strategy. If you keep that, I don't care what you do, your spine's safe. Briefly, let's talk about just optimal rep. Is there an optimal rep number? How do you determine, um, do you want to go to failure? Hmm. Is that is that valuable? And then when do you do body weight training versus versus lifting heavy or bands? Don't let me forget all those. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> all right. We'll start off with, uh, what was the very first one you wanted to do? Uh, do you uh, lift first, cardio first? Quick answer is, do the thing you care about most first. If you're really wanting to do your conditioning first, do that first. If you don't care, I would generally say lift first. It's harder on your body. It's, it's, it's harder. harder to, yeah. Like, so the, it's the same example we used with our grip earlier. Mm-hmm. If you're trying to train your grip and are you trying to train like your deadlift and you've gone and done a bunch of grip exercises before and now your deadlift is failing because of your grip rather than failing because you're deadlift, mm-hmm. now we didn't get the thing out of it. And so if you go do a bunch of conditioning and you show up tired and fatigued to the gym and you're trying to maximize strength, let's say, mm-hmm. you can't push the same number. Yeah. You're going to have a problem. If you're trying to go for hypertrophy or muscular endurance in the gym, then you're fine because you're just trying to get the muscle tired anyways. So you're absolutely good there. How do you determine the optimal number of reps? You have some freedom there. It does. It's not as specific as people get worried about sometimes. So whenever we give numbers there, it's still just a scale, right? So if I say the hypertrophy range is between 8 to 30 repetitions, that doesn't mean at 7 you get none. Mm-hmm. Like it's still, it just like kind of starts to fade as you get towards the end of the spectrum. And that's what the research will show on hypertrophy. You have a large range, right? Even five to 30 repetitions. In fact, if you did more than 30, it would probably still work. For strength, you need a specific adaptation. You need high intensity, which means you need a low repetition range so you can actually get load on the bar. So that's typically one to five, one to six, one to seven, like something like that um, is the range for muscle strength. If you want a really easy uh, system, um, it's been around since like the early 1990s. Uh, we, We colloquially call it the three to five. Right, which is, all right, three to five times per week. Pick three to five exercises. Mm -hmm. Do three to five sets, three to five reps per set, and rest three to five minutes between sets. If you want to go for power, go lighter. If you want to go for strength, go higher. If you land within that realm, now that could be as simple as three days a week, you do three exercises, and you do three sets of three. That's With a really heavy weight. If you're looking for... Yeah. Yeah. For strength. It's heavy. Yep. Yeah. Could be as high as five days a week, five sets of five, five exercises. That's a pretty good load, right? Mm-hmm. So it can be anywhere in between. All that's going to be fine for strength or power. Again, depending... If you want to go power, you have to go things that are a little bit lighter so you go faster. Got it. That's the difference, right? Power is mm-hmm. force times speed. Um, if you're just truly there for strength, then just go heavier. You do not need to go to complete failure for strength. You do not need to go to complete failure for hypertrophy. In fact, most of the research is going to tell you, if for both of those things, you want to probably spend most of your time in like 80% range, not percent of one rep max, but in this case, I'm saying like have one rep left in the tank, mm-hmm. have two reps left in the tank, probably not more than that, but you don't have to go to zero either. Right. You can in some situations, but you don't have to. And in terms of hypertrophy, should you focus on strength or power or alternate? None. None. If you want hypertrophy, focus on hypertrophy. Spend your entire time there. Hypertrophy is fun in the sense that you can do more traditional what feel like strength type of sessions. Mm -hmm. So heavy things, right? Like you really got to pay attention. And you can do body weight. Mm -hmm. You can do bands. You can do blood flow restriction. You can do whatever you want because you can just get to a pump. Mm -hmm. You can get to a burn. Those things are absolutely, um, those are mechanisms that will induce muscle hypertrophy. It's just like getting a gnarly pump on a muscle, which means it can be very, very, very light. That won't do much or anything for strength though. Got it. So if you want strength and muscle size, which I think most people would be aiming for, right? But maybe not. Depends, right? Maybe like not. I don't know why you would like not want to get stronger, right? Based on all the things we've talked about today, too. Of course. <laughs> What's really important is that people are having a ton of fun, mm-hmm. and they're being really consistent, and that they're trying really hard. So I will do that sometimes. I will go through entire phases, even months at a time, where I'm like, "Yo, I'm gonna do stuff that is way fun. I haven't done sets of fifty in a while." Let's go nuts, right? Like, am I getting the same strength gains? No. But I'm doing a little bit different insult to my joint. I'm getting, like, you feel really good after those sessions. You don't have to, like, mentally get yourself 
fired up and put all the weights on and get super warmed up. And yeah. like, you can kind of just like get right into it, right? Like, yeah. all right, when I'm traveling, um, when I'm stuck in hotel rooms and I have like nothing or I go to a hotel gym and they have a 10 pound dumbbell and that's it. It's like, all right, I guess we're doing sets of 30. Like, let's go, right? We're doing giant sets. We're doing things like that. We're just going to get a giant pump. There's nothing wrong with that for a while too. Uh, if we're thinking about this over the 50, 60 year span, you got plenty of time to, to do other things for a while, but you would want to spend like maybe most of your time um, in that range. What, what you want to be careful of is doing everything every year for years on end, eight to 12 reps, right? Like you, you're way too limited in the adaptation. Spend more time in sets of five, spend more time in sets of 20 uh, and really play up and down that spectrum. That's really helpful. Is that one of, in terms of the biggest mistakes you see people make in terms of exercise outside of doing things, the same thing over and over again, yep. or staying in sets of eight, reps of eight to 12, yep. are there other things that people do often? Yeah. I mean, other ones that, uh, I don't call them mistakes, but I would say things that, that people do that lead to frustrations or lack of progress is really, because they're not mistakes, they're things that work, but it's like, okay, you're stalling now, Yeah, is no specific overload. Right, we need to be progressing somehow in some fashion. Progression can look like more reps, could look like less reps. Um, if if you're gonna do less reps, then we need to add more sets, or we need to add more exercises, or we need to add more intensity. Fine, we could reduce our rest interval, lots of ways. But there has to be some progression. How do you decide on what to progress? Well, what are you trying to get? If you want to get stronger, you don't need to worry about as many reps and sets, but you have to add more weight to the bar. Right. If you want to get more caloric expenditure or fat loss, then I don't really care about the weight on the bar. I need to get more work done. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll add more reps, more sets, more exercises, more days a week. Like you have lots of options, right? Um, if you're trying to just stimulate different adaptation that you haven't had in a while, okay, maybe you do none of that stuff and you go down to no rest and you put it into a big circuit and you keep your heart rate going the entire time. The quality of every repetition and how much weight you can put on goes down. But fine, because you're not really there to try to maximize strength during that phase of your training. You're trying to do something else different, right? Um, this is also where I'll encourage, you need to have fun. Yeah. You really do, right? And so maybe you're going to go one day a week, you're going to do a cardio kickboxing class. Maybe one day a week, you're going to go work out with a friend and you're going to do jumping jacks. Like, whatever. Like, do something that you're like, that's really fun. It doesn't have to necessarily just be like a structured program. But you've got to make sure there's some sort of progressive overload. Um, that would be one of the number one reasons why people like stop getting success or are getting successes by training is that, okay, what's the progression? Mm -hmm. um, second one that comes to mind oftentimes is, I've talked about this now in large part, but I never call it out directly. And that is you're always playing a game of specificity versus variation. When you get more specific, you get a more clear adaptation faster, but you compromise well-roundedness, right? Mm -hmm. If you go super well-rounded, you compromise. You feel like you get nowhere, right? So it's imagine you had, you're playing 50 games of chess at once mm -hmm. and you're making one move. Like you could be there for five hours and you look across the board and you're like, nothing happened. I didn't win any game yet. Nothing's progressed. Well, yeah, because you're, you're doing one move in all these different areas. And like, but if you did that actually for years, you would eventually have all those 50 games finished. The specificity one is being like, no, I'm not even going to start those other 49 games. I'm going to play this game completely, and then I'll go to the next game and the next game. I can't argue one's better than the other. By the end of this, say, five years, in both those scenarios, you'll have finished all 50 games. Yeah. It's just a matter of, like, what are you monitoring? Is What are you uh, qualifying progress? If you're like, um, I'm kind of feeling a little bit, but I'm really worried about how I feel a year from now, we'll do 50 things at once Yeah. and progress them all. If you need to see feedback now, be more specific, but make sure you're progressing. So I have a question for you. I read a paper on, um, it was a review paper on sexual intercourse, and they tried to determine the metabolic equivalent uh, <laughs> of sex, and they yeah. looked at a bunch of review papers. They looked at what positions elicited the most demand mm -hmm. and what sort of strain there was on the body. So found that the mean intensity was about six metabolic equivalent oh, yeah. units, which is about moderate intensity, Yeah, um, which is similar to, they wrote in the paper, jogging, swimming, um, stationary rowing. Totally. Uh, that man on top is the greatest demand, and that, at least from the ones they looked at, uh, lumbar flexion, hip flexion, rotation, abduction are sort of the most uh, utilized or demanding um, areas. Yep. So 
in terms of if you're wanting to optimize your ability to have sex. So forget they don't want a good life. They don't want they don't want to be I love they it. This is so much sex. more fun. Yeah. <laughs> they want to have good sex until they're 80, 90, 100 years old. Yeah. How can they do that? When I started as a faculty member uh, 12 years ago, this came up my very first semester. And I will never forget this because my friend Lenny Wiersma is a sports psychologist. He's phenomenal. He's since retired. But he like looked over at me. I don't, I, this, I don't know if this came up in a faculty meeting or something. I swear to you, because that was like, in my, I don't know if it was that exact same paper or one of those papers that men on houses, but he looked at me and he was like, they've never seen me have sex. <laughs> and I was like, ah. <laughs> I died laughing. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Like he's an endurance athlete, but I was like, yeah. And I'm like, it's man. variable. It is so variable. Of course. And they, of course. They, they did acknowledge that in the paper. It's variable based on position, based on how long you're having sex. Style and all of yeah. it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Work great. Load. And not every time you have sex, it's the same. Right. So somewhere one or the other. All right. So great. You're going to, you're, you're looking for a couple of things. Now, I can't speak to one part of sexual performance. That's your expertise. So you can handle that side of the equation. I'll also say like the physical abilities to it. Um, obviously, getting your VO2 max as high as one possibly can would beat the win there. So if you're talking about exercising at six Mets, right? So this is now like our line of independence. Instead of calling it a line of independence, I should call it like a line of sex. I bet you people would listen more. We're way more, right? Yeah. It's like, if you fall below this, you can't have sex anymore. Yeah. Whoa, I don't care about someone else wiping my ass when I poop. But like, if I can't have sex, I'm out. I'm out right? Yeah. Your marketing is on point here. <laughs> your it's so important. It's great. So. Yeah, no, totally. Okay. So obviously getting your views to max as high as possible. You're talking about very, like, like very obviously hip extension, mm-hmm. right? Um, now you want to do that in a way, a couple things. So you want to make sure you get, this is, this is, I'm like actually super focused. This is really hilarious. I've never thought about it like this. But one of the major issues people have with hip extension and low back pain is they fail to get terminal hip extension. So what that means is almost everybody can extend their hip. So right now we're sitting, our hip is flexed, right? So if I stand up, you stand up, and we're extending our hip, right? That's what it means. Everyone can do that. A lot of people will fail to get that last 10%. And so when they're standing up, in order to get their hips fully forward, they can't get there. And so what they actually end up doing is arching their low back. Yeah. So they're getting hip extension via there. Now this happens for one of two global reasons. One, um, you have restrictive hip flexion which means so as something like that, something on the anterior side is extensively tight. So when you go to extend that hip, something's blocking it. Because the psoas ins- or originates in the anterior side, the front side, I am sorry, I got a lot of jargon there. Um, since that hip flexor muscle uh, starts on the front middle portion of your spine, when it gets tight, it pulls your low back forward, right? Mm-hmm. This is like belly forward, low back arc, right? Yep. So you are erect. I see that. That was a little mm-hmm. pun. You're good. You're erect here. You're standing vertical. Your head and shoulders feel that, but you're not getting there in the right position, right? So you've compromised one to get the other. So it's either that. Second one is it can actually be a, a failure of contractile properties of the glutes. So you're not getting to hip extension properly because it could be an adductor issue, um, could be piriformis issue. There's lots of actual mm-hmm. uh, anatomy here that's con- that's causing um, terminal hip extension to be there. And so making sure that you can not hurt your low back, especially if it's men on top or mm-hmm. any hip extension position, you want to make sure that you can get into full hip extension without compromising your low back. This does two things. One, keeps you out of injury, and two, enhances power, right? Yeah. Force production is greater when we can actually get there um, via active contraction rather than blocking and getting hip extension, what feels like hip extension, from low back. Obviously, our low back is much weaker than our glutes, and so we want to make sure our force output's coming from that area. You do both of those things. In addition, now we have higher efficiency, so muscular endurance is higher. I can't promise you that your sexual stamina will be any higher, but your fatigue, your perception of fatigue will be much higher because you're moving much more efficiently. And you won't hurt yourself. And you won't hurt yourself. Which is which is truly serious. There was another study where they surveyed hip surgeons who yep. did hip replacements. And while well, I don't have the, the exact number, but at least 50 of them had mentioned that someone had dislocated their new hip having sex. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. Ap- right after surgery. And so... You can injure yourself, whether yeah. it's post-surgical or not. I mean, you can have hip injury um, and obviously lower back strain from sex. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Um, you also want to pay attention to, to knee range of motion as well. So making sure that your knee can get into full flexion. Mm-hmm. Um, this is now like a rectus femoris. Uh, tend to be a, some sort of a quadricep issue. It can be anterior. 
um, of your knees as well, so your tibial and anterior. But making sure that's going to allow you to be able to get, depending on what positions you're in, as long as, because if your knee is dysfunctional, it's going to lead to dysfunction. Most of your muscles cross one joint, okay? But at every single joint, you have a muscle that'll cross multiple. Mm -hmm. In the case of your hip, you have the, the quadriceps. That means four muscles, right? So three of those four muscles just cross the knee joint. So they all come together to make the patella and cross the front of the kneecap there. One of them actually also crosses the knee joint, crosses the hip. And so this is how you, you have one muscle that is going to partially control multiple joints. So making sure that you're paying attention to that, because if you don't and that muscle is a problem or any other muscle in the knee is a problem, that then results in your hip being in a bad position. So it may not have anything to do with the hip flexors or the glutes. It could be dysfunction at the knee mm -hmm. that's then enabling or disabling the hip to function properly. All right. So make sure you're getting full hip extension. Full hip extension. Are there specific exercises that they can do for that? It would depend on dysfunction, mm -hmm. um, but making sure, number one, there's nothing blocking it. So making sure there's no dysfunction in the interior side, so the hip flexor or the knee flexor, or the yeah. extenders. Um, and then secondarily, being conscious about quality of contraction. You mentioned earlier mind-muscle connection, mm -hmm. which is the idea of don't just worry about the sets and reps. Think about the muscles that you want to contract and focus on quality of contraction. So for hip extension, really paying attention to when you finish extension on your squat or your hip thrust, your lunges, your step-ups, anything that you're doing where you're extending the hip, making sure that when you're finishing those things, you're doing it intently and you're not just getting 90% of the way there and then going on to the next repetition or finishing with hip extension, really finishing that with a full glute contraction mm -hmm. until you get in that vertical erect position. That would be the, the tip. There are individual exercises. The hip thrust yep. is an obvious one. Um, you know, Brett Contreras is brought us that for a long time. Um, but any number of ones can be done. Uh, a lunge, uh, a step up, uh, a split squat, uh, rear foot elevated split squats, any number of those things can be done to, to help. And then in terms of knee joints, you know, stability and, and muscular strength for, for that. Yeah. So anytime that you're stabilizing your hip, mm -hmm. knee is going to be involved, right? So those same exercises are going to do the same thing. Yeah. Now, think about it this way. If you're doing, say, a lunge or a split squat, the more your knee is staying vertical, that shin, your shin is being vertical, so your knee is over your toe, the more generally you're going to be challenging behind the knee joint, mm -hmm. hip extension, right, hamstrings. If you let your knee travel over your toes, now it's going to be putting more of a quad dominant position generally. And so if you've already, if you've looked at your program and you're like, man, I've done one or two or three exercises that are very hip dominant already, Maybe change the position so that your knee is out in front of your toe mm -hmm. to get something to go after the quad because you don't want to leave that there. Or maybe you do something as simple and straightforward as a leg extension machine, mm -hmm. right? Whatever it is. Here's the key to all that stuff. I gave you some specific exercises, but none of that crap matters because your biomechanics are different. All you should care about is, do you actually feel it in that muscle? When you're doing squats and you think squats are for your glutes and you never feel your glutes get tired, they never get sore and they're not growing, then the back squat's not working your, gl your glute. Despite the fact that the research could say it is a great exercise for it, I could have great results for it. Your technique is different. Your uh, anthropometrics are different. Your positioning is different, right? So that's the three stuff I pay attention to. Do you feel it when you're actually exercising? Mm -hmm. Is it getting at all sore? And sore is not better, but at least indicates to you that it's working. And then three, are you seeing results? If not, you need to move your foot position. You need to do it on a different machine. You need to grab a different implement. You need to try a different range of motion until you can feel one of those three things. Uh, if not, you're not in the right spot. So many more questions I could ask you, but I don't want to take so much of your time. I want to finish with, tell me something that you're really excited about that you're working on in your lab right now. Oh, well, we have a couple of projects going on right now. Um, one of them is we're very interested in, we, we, I've been fortunate to deal with, work with a lot of professional female athletes. The research there, as you know, is challenging. Mm -hmm. NIH and things like that are better about including women in studies now, yeah. but they don't have very many questions that are specific female questions, right? So we're not asking questions that are not relevant to men. Yeah. It's always, oh, they're relevant to men, but also it's not irrelevant to women, so we'll throw them in. Got it. Yeah. Right, but that's different than going after mm -hmm. female-specific questions. We're actually running a study right now. My, my uh, graduate student, Julian, is doing an interesting project looking at whether or not hormone-based birth control in female athletes. Mm -hmm. And what is the association there, if any, between that and sex hormones, as well as the gut microbiome? 
because there's a little bit of an algorithm happening there where we know that uh, exercise influences both those other factors. We know both those other factors influence the other ones, and it's like a little bit of a thing there. So that is interesting to sort of untangle. Like That's really fascinating. Yeah. I don't know. Where the you know, we know that there's a subset of people who take oral contraceptives. I mean, we know their SHBG or their sex hormone yeah, yeah. globulin will go up, but they actually become symptomatic because their testosterone goes down. Of course. And then they get low libido. Um, but not everyone. Not everyone. But it certainly happens to a you know, subset of people. And yeah. so uh, that is sort of an interesting. Well, there's initial evidence at this point that the gut microbiome is uh, plays a fairly critical role, critical role in sex hormones for women. And so our question is, we also have indications that the gut microbiome may be altered by birth control. We also know, temporarily, no is a strong word, that exercise alters the gut microbiome as well. We just had a paper published on this. And so it's like, well, wait a minute. What if you're taking hormones that are changing it, you're exercising that's changing it, and then that's all changing your hormone concentrations? Like, what's the magic recipe here? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it like to show up as nothing. Maybe being so physically fit outweighs everything and nothing matters. Maybe it doesn't matter. I, I don't know what the answer is going to be there. And it's going to be very complicated. And I can tell you right now, regardless, our study is not going to answer the question. You need, But it's an initial study and it's an important question. And I yeah. think I, I applaud you for doing it because there's not enough data on women in general. Yeah. Like if you look at studies, I, I, I talked about this before, but like if you look at like in my field, right? You type in penis in uh, Google Scholar or PubMed, you get 50,000 results. Oh, yeah. When you put in clitoris, Ten. you get 2,000. <laughs> yeah. You get some. You get yeah. some. But it's it's a lot less, right? Yeah, and sure. so just in general, women have been understudied, and I think that's really, really valuable. Yeah, easier structures to study probably. Yeah. If you're a female athlete in the Cal State Fullerton area, let us know because it's, um, poor Julian, man, it is a very challenging study to pull off because we got to take blood multiple times during specific phases of the menstrual cycle. Um, because, by the way, that alters. Of course. And we have to take stool multiple times throughout the menstrual cycle because there's actually data that suggests, some suggest it doesn't. I don't actually know what the answer is going to be, but that the gut microbiome itself will change just during different phases of the menstrual cycle. It will. I, I think it does. If it does. If you're a research participant, we love you, and you are so <laughs> valuable to the world. Yeah, man. And uh, please consider it, really. Uh, okay, I have some like very quick rapid questions that we usually end with. What's something that you know now that you wish you knew earlier? I was really bad when I was in school of just keeping things. Mm -hmm. So there's all these notes. And I was the type where I'm like, as soon as the class is over, I threw everything away. Yeah. <laughs> like literally, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, damn, like, what are kind of cool to save all that stuff I spent 10 years, like, accumulating? Um, and that's the same thing for athlete. Like, I just was not good at keeping athlete data and stuff for a long time. So I wish I would have been better about some of those things. So I don't know if that's like a very fun answer, but that came to mind. Is no, I think it's helpful. I mean, I wrote these beautiful anatomy notes when I was in medical school yeah. and I still refer back to them. I don't I yeah, yeah. all my notes, but I kept those because I spent a lot of time on them and I was like, you know what? I will want to look back at these. You know what's wild? So for my PhD, again, I'm not a real doctor. Uh, I'm You're this side doctor. of the doctor. You're okay. You're <laughs> we got to take uh, one of our physiology class we got to take in med school. Mm -hmm. So during my semester, I was the only student in that class who's not a medical med student, which is really cool. And we got to do the med style of school, right? Which is, you know, like like entire courses in eight weeks. Yeah. Four hours a day sort of thing. It was just wild. That's the only class I kept my notes from. Still this day, like it's the only ones I have, which is really fun. I don't ever use it at all, but I'm always like, yeah, that's cool. What's a non-negotiable for you? Something you got to do every day. My overall philosophy to life is the opposite of that, which is you can play a game of sensitivity and you play a game of resilience. And there's some things you want to be really sensitive to, and there's things you want to be really resilient to. I spend more of my time pushing towards resilience, which is like, I don't want to be in a position where I have to do anything. I don't want to have to have to do breath work. I don't want to have to exercise. I don't want to have to eat a certain way or a certain time or anything like that to have a phenomenal day. Um, that's probably because I come from the country, and I like to spend a lot of times outdoors where it's like, you're not going to have, like, something that like you just deal with it. And so... Um, I actually work really hard to make sure and like, if anything is like where I'm like, oh man, that, that's great every day. Okay, great. Make sure you can still perform without those things. So that is a that is a non-negotiable. My non-negotiable is I, I never want to be in a position where I have to have my special mattress to sleep. I don't want to have to have my special routine to have like a focused conversation. Um, I need to be able, I believe like I should be able to perform under any circumstances at my best, not just like get through it. 
but yeah. you should be resilient against all those things. So I have like my anti-routine routine, which is not to say to be super clear. I don't just like make up, wake up and do like random shit all day. <laughs> like that's not at all how I operate. Um, I think it's adaptable. I, I want people to understand like what are the set and circumstances you have to do to have your best performance. That's great. And replicate that most of the time. But don't become precious. Right. Don't become so precious where like, oh my gosh, I haven't done blah 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 blah. Now like excuses, excuses. Like, no. Like you need to be able to be resilient and to be able to crush no matter what the situation is. Um, for any number of reasons. Like you throw kids in the mix, you'll learn that lesson like real fast, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That that's my non negotiable. What's one thing you wish that you could do or thing that would be done that could change the world? I spend most of my time on what I'll collectively call the future of human performance mm -hmm. rather than the current. I think the biggest hole we have is almost everything that is understood about human health and performance is disease prevention. We don't have anything on the other side of the equation. We have not sick yet, and now there's a lot of people moving towards like the middle ground. But the physiology of high human performance is zero. We know highest VO2 max ever. We know some of these things. Reference ranges for blood work. People have no idea what should your blood glucose be. Well, we know what diabetes is and we know what, but like, what should it be? If you're a robot, where should it be? Right? That's right. I mean, the best example. Let's take homocysteine. Let's take AL, uh, albumin. Let's take uh, AST, ALT. Like, where should they be? Like, a, a medical doctor is going to answer these questions way differently. Based on right? Not, not based on height. Yeah. And, and we, we publish data on this, um, and we have more stuff coming soon. But those things, um, they're almost such that, like, it's almost zero. It's almost like throw the whole thing away and start again. What we really need, and all this, by the way, is based on, like, we, we've had thousands of athletes on our stuff, so we have a really good idea there. But I need five million. So when you ask, like, what's the world problem, that's what I want. I want to know, I want to know 25 million, right? I want to know 50 million people in there, and I want to know what were the top five percentile of performers, not athletes, performers, mm -hmm. focus, energy, attention, love, affection, like all those things, right? Put That's performance. That's still performance to us, right? Whatever you, however you want to look, feel, perform, that's it. And then I want to know, like, what is common between those? Yes, we know that there's different ways to get to different places. That's great, but that can be figured out. And so I want to know, I want to give people not just like, congratulations, not dead yet. We want to give like, great, you are awesome. And what I'm really kind of getting at is, is like my entire career at this point is going from good to great. And how do you get to great? And I want great. Yeah. I want to know what great is. In all those areas, what should you care about? What is great? And how do we get you there? And with evidence, right? Not just like speculation, which is what a lot of we have right now. Speculation. Yeah. Well, I mean, like our stuff is speculation at this point, right? Mm -hmm. well, again, we have thousands of athletes in our database, and I've got over 15 years of doing this stuff. Like, we're a pretty good feel. We tend to be right. But you have science behind it. I want, I want science, though. And I want the world to know all those numbers. I don't want those to be like, yo, Andy, what's your reference range? And be like, no, you can't have that, right? Yeah. I want to put this out and be like, no, no, hold, everyone go. can have it. Here's the whole world. Yeah, that's the goal. That's awesome. And then lastly, what's one health hack or life hack that you would share? And I, I, the word hack is sort of- no, I get you there. <laughs> I'll, I'll hold you to that one. I will say your body is screaming at you all day. You have to listen. People can often be in places where they have a hard time reading and regulating. There's a phenomenal uh, individual I'm lucky to work with, Emily Hightower, uh, and she has uh, articulated this so well read and regulate. This is not calm down. This is not lower stress. It's none of those things. It is simply reading and regulating. You don't know what your body is saying. So listen to what your body is saying. That doesn't mean you're in your feels all the time, right? This is you going, man, I feel low energy. I can acknowledge that. Say, how's that driving how I'm interacting with the world? It is. Do you even acknowledge that, right? Are you just going through the thing, right? Uh, this is positive and negative, right? So this is like, it's almost being able to detach and saying, okay, I'm looking at now from this the outside, like I'm not bringing it as present as I want to be, or like I'm being very present right now. That's great. Like, it's not just a negative thing and it's not just chills, not just down there. So uh, that to me, I think is a, is a superpower of folks. And when they can get a grasp of reading their own physiology, then they can regulate it like very quickly, right? And so um, you, you see this manifested in children, like so obviously. Then when you watch adults interact, you're like, oh, you've totally lost that ability to read. You're, like you remember when your kids were younger, mm -hmm. they are very good at telling you exactly where they're at. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> or screaming it. <laughs> well, well that's, that's, that's the thing, right? Yeah. It's just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Adults won't necessarily do that, but they'll scream in different ways, mm -hmm. right? Whether their scream might be grabbing their phone 
and not paying attention, right? The scream could be doing any number of different things, right? Yeah. Um, it's how we're coping with our stressors and not in always a, a positive way. Yeah, and it's not always negative either. Again, it can be like a super positive thing, right? It could be like, man, you know what I've noticed when I get really focused, this thing happens. Ah, great. I wasn't even aware of that. That's fantastic. I've learned that about myself. This is a great thing, right? I've known um, the thing that ends up making me have a better workout is this. Like, oh, that's interesting. I'm reading when I'm seeing this signal. So we tend to hear this type of stuff and we always assume the negative side of it. Yeah. But it can be the positive side of it too. So um, that that's the, that's the way I answer it is, is better appreciation and understanding of reading and regulating. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been so, so helpful. I literally could ask you like a hundred more questions because there's just so much information that you put out there in the world that's so helpful and useful. And so follow Dr. Galpin. Where can people follow you? Uh, Instagram and Twitter at Dr. Andy Galpin are the, the easiest places for sure. Um, they're like like you, they're entirely science communication. So mm -hmm. if you want to see a bunch of dorky stuff about human performance, that's pretty much all I do. Yeah, but it's great. It's so great. So thank you so much. Thank you. If you are enjoying the podcast and you want to find a zero-cost way to support us, make sure you check us out on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Leave us a rating or review or subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Also, feel free to follow me on our other social media platforms, including Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and more, where we release other content that is related to urologic health, sexual health, and just general life. And the best way to say thank you to us is to recommend our podcast to your friends and family. As always, we're going to take care of yourself because you're worth it.